Good evening and welcome to the September 27th Parks and Recreation Commission meeting. Uh, we have a, a large uh, enthusiastic, uh, presumably enthusiastic crowd with us this evening. Thank you, it's nice to see. Uh, and look, look forward to hearing from, from many of you. I can't hear you. And look, we'll look forward to hearing many of you. How's that better? Yeah, yeah. All right, we're, we're in a little bit different digs than we are usually today. The, the first uh, uh, business, uh, uh, first step up is a uh, roll call. Can you please uh, do a uh, call for us? Chair Greenfield. Here. Vice Chair Lemaire. Here. Commissioner Brown. Here. Commissioner Cribbs. Here. Commissioner Freeman? Here. Commissioner Kleinhaus? Yes. Commissioner Oche? Here, please. Chair, that's seven present. Thank you. And if there's any members of the public who would like to speak to an item that's not on the agenda, uh, now's an opportunity to uh, get your speaker card into Javad over on the right. Uh, and if there's anybody who is joining us remotely uh, via Zoom who would like to, to speak uh, to an item not uh, on the agenda, the same goes. Uh, raise your hand, please. Could you scoot a little closer to your mic? We can hear it's, uh, seeing if I can get the mic a little closer to me. I, <laughs> All right, how are we doing now? All right. Is there a volume control on this? I don't know if you can chair at the bottom. If you scroll to the right. Yep. That, but, out there? No. So is, is this increasing my volume? Yes. 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 Okay. There we go. Okay. Uh, first up is Herb Borak. You have uh, three minutes to speak. Welcome. Hey, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Greenfield, Vice Chair Lemaire, and Commissioners. I have two items. The first is the grove of redwood trees uh, in the Magic Forest in Rinconada Park uh, along Hopkins, Hopkins Avenue between the electrical substation and the um, tennis courts and uh, well site. Uh, they're dead and dying. And uh, there had been a project on the well site uh, a few years ago. And uh, also we have the, the climate and drought. And currently, I think the current uh, three trees were marked for for removal. And uh, in the recent past, four others, I recall. And it doesn't seem that the area is being taken care of. I mean, urban forestry knows enough to cut down dead trees, but as far as you know, taking care of them, I don't. I don't know. the The well site project was, you know, to. Uh, remediate what was on the surface, but they also dug under park between the well site and, and the pool and the other trees that are dying in the past were even further away. Uh, the, the second issue is the fiber to the uh, premises project, which is going to have proposed three fiber huts. And when it was before the Utilities Advisory Commission, they had six possibilities of which they probably choose three. And one was at the fire station on Rostadera Road, fire station five. Uh, when it came to the council last week, they didn't have any uh, maps as they had before, but they mentioned that it would be at uh, Brioni's Park, formerly the Rostadero Park, which, which borders that fire station. And I don't know why they would want to choose dedicated parkland for a fiber hut. Uh, since it required going to the commission and getting a park improvement ordinance and it'll be subject to a referendum in a neighborhood that's previously done a successful referendum and in a competitive environment where uh, AT&T and Comcast might want to help finance it. So I don't know why that change was made from the fire station uh, to the adjoining park, but it didn't make any sense to me. Thank you. Thank you. And I believe that's all of the speakers we have for oral communications this evening. That's correct. No more public comment. Thank you. Uh, next up is agenda changes, additions, and deletions. Do any commissioners have anything to suggest? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. I scrolled down too fast. 
before we get to that, uh, adoption of a resolution authorizing use of teleconferencing for Parks and Recreation Commission meeting during our COVID-19 state of emergency. This is something we do every month to allow us to continue to meet in a hybrid means. Uh, this, this, uh, yep. So, so this, this is something that uh, is, is used uh, so that we can have, continue having hybrid meetings both in person and uh, with people online via Zoom. Uh, could I get a motion to approve this? So moved. Thank you, and a second, please. Second. Thank you, and a roll call vote, please. Chair Greenfield? Yes. Vice Chair LaMere? Yes. Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Cribbs? Yes. Commissioner Freeman? Yes. Commissioner Kleinhaus? Yes. Commissioner Oj? Yes, please. Chair, that's a 7-0 vote. Thank you. Before we proceed, is there any way to increase the volume of the speakers out in the gallery? Chair, I'll check into that, but I believe because everyone died at a closed vote. But I will check into that while yes. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Now we're on to agenda, agenda changes, additions, and deletions. Uh, any, any suggestions? If not, we'll move on uh, to the approval of our uh, minutes from the September 1st meeting, which was a Um, we're we're doing the best doing the best we can. I appreciate it. Uh, if there weren't uh, further interruptions on that. Yeah, you, you more can. people should move in. And and there are a few, there are a few seats as well. Uh, uh, does anyone, uh, uh, Darren, uh, are these the first minutes uh, we've had with the new service doing it? Uh, I personally would comment that I, I thought they were significantly improved and uh, uh, give you a thumbs up on that one. Thank oh, you. Good to hear. Thanks. Do any commissioners have any uh, changes to suggest or comments? Anne? I do on um, page 18 or 19, lane nine, uh, line eight, 19. Um, it right now says something about uh, a survey for racquetball. It should say a survey for pickleball and tennis. <laughs> I think we can probably go with that. Any any other uh, updates to the minutes anyone would like to suggest? I just wanted to add as a point of order, I think in the past, uh, commissioners have recused themselves when they have missed a meeting. I did consult Robert's Rules of Order and consult with a certified municipal clerk that they actually encourage commissioners to vote on meetings that they've missed, but it does require you to go back and view the meeting and read the minutes because the vote is that the minutes are an accurate reflection of what transpired at the meeting. So I will be voting on this item. Thank you for the clarification, Commissioner Brown. We're glad to have you here and glad to have your uh, participation in the uh, approval of the minutes. Would anyone like to make a motion to approve the draft minutes? I'll make the motion. Thank you, Commissioner Kleinhaus, and a second. I'll second. Thank you, Vice Chair, and a roll call vote. Roll call vote, please. Chair Greenfield? Yes. Vice Chair LaMare? Yes. Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Cribbs? Yes. Commissioner Freeman? Yes. Commissioner Kleinhaus? Yes. Commissioner Oche? Yes, please. Chair, that's a 7 0 vote. Thank you. Okay, this evening we rearranged the uh, order of the agenda items a little bit. Uh, the department report is going to come after the business items. This is to uh, allow staff members to be present for this item who, who will also be involved with the city council meeting uh, going on next door. And, and we have a, a crowd of people that uh, are probably interested in speaking as soon as they can as well. Uh, so our next our next item will be park dedication measure E site, uh, and uh, Darren, would you like to uh, move proceed with the presentation on this? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Good evening, everyone. Darren Anderson with Community Services Department. Can you hear me? Okay. All right. Well, we're here tonight to discuss and collect your feedback on dedicating the 10 acre Measure E site as parkland, which is one of the commission's work plan goals. This is an area- excuse, excuse me, Darren, and before you proceed, if, if there's any members who, of the public who'd like to speak on this item, uh, you'll have an opportunity to speak after uh, the presentation. Uh, if you can fill out a speaker card and give it to Javad, or if you're online, if you can raise your hand via Zoom. Thank you. 
Pardon the interruption. No, no trouble at all. Uh, so on this aerial map, I just want to orient you to this Measure E site. You can see Bixby Park labeled here. And on the other side, RWQCP, that's Regional Water Quality Control Plant. We've got a tidal section of the Baylands to the left, the Emily Renzel Wetlands to the right, and then you could see the airport and the duck pond off to there. I'm gonna switch now to a Google map so I can zoom in and show you a little more detail some of the elements of that site. Bear with me just a second as I share screens. Okay, so again, reorienting you again, here's Bixby Park, and here's the water quality control plant, the tidal section over here and the Emily Renzel section here. So this is the back fence of the regional water quality control plant, and that's where the Measure E site starts. And it moves out towards Bixby, out into this area, and it's 10 acres of this spot. It's about a third of it's flat, and that's primarily the area from the fence upwards to this first trail or so, and then starts to increase and it's on a slope. There's this service road here and this maintenance facility. I'm gonna show you this real quick. This maintenance facility was there before the 2011 ballot measure to undedicate this site, and it remains. It's there so that the public works team can manage the methane and leachate systems that are part of the former landfill operation <coughs> now currently Bixby Park. I'm gonna drop in just for a second, give you the street view so you can see what this looks like. So here's that maintenance shed area that I mentioned. Here's the backside of the treatment plant. And this is looking uphill towards the rest of Bixby Park. And then to our right, the Emily Renzel Wetlands over here. All right, back to the PowerPoint. So it's important to note that this area was parkland before. It was 10 acre site and it was undedicated by a vote of the Palo Alto residents in 2011. It was April 2010 that city council directed staff to initiate feasibility study for an energy compost facility that would be located in Palo Alto. In 2011, the feasibility report recommended that if the site at Bixby Park was available through the passage of a ballot measure E, then the city should take further actions to consider an anaerobic digestion and other technologies for managing the city's food scraps, yard trimmings, and biosolids at the site. In November 2011, measure E passed, which undedicated that 10 acres for a 10 year time period to be used exclusively for the energy compost facility. And those 10 acres would be reserved for that purpose until November 2021. And after that date, City Council could, if they wanted, elect to return the area to parkland. In 2014, City Council directed staff to not pursue the development of compost facility. And this is due to staff concluding that the compost facility was not cost effective. So as a result, Palto's yard trimmings and food scraps are taken instead to a dry anaerobic digester in San Jose. Here's a few key sections of the Measure E ballot. The first is the question that was posed to the voters on the ballot itself. Shall the 10 acres of existing parkland at Bixby be undedicated? Second bullet mentions that the property would be undedicated for the exclusive purpose of building a facility for converting yard trimmings, food waste, and other municipal organic materials. The third bullet mentions that the 10 year, after the 10 year initiative, council may rededicate any portion of the property that was not used for the processing facility. And lastly, any other use except for parkland would require a new vote of the Palo Alto residents. In August, the ad hoc committee is working on this topic and staff met with the public works team and toured this site. And public works staff had explained that their department has no foreseeable projects or staff proposals for the future use of the Measure E site. In September, the ad hoc met with the Utilities Advisory Commission Chair and the staff liaison, and they explained that the Utilities Department likewise has no plans for the Measure E site, that they are trying not to extend utility infrastructure that close to the Bay. 
and that they have no concerns with the PRC pursuing dedicating the site as parkland. They noted that it wouldn't prohibit future discussion for future uses of the land if there was a need and voters could vote to undedicate it for some other use if the need be. The ad hoc committee had articulated the following reasons for pursuing dedicating the Measure East site as parkland. The first being the Measure East site can only be used for that exclusive purpose we've mentioned. Any non-parkland use other than that one mentioned in Measure E would require a new vote of residence and neither the Public Works Department or the Utilities Department have plans for the site. Additionally, the Measure E site includes a wildlife habitat corridor that connects the Renzel wetlands uh, with the bay that should be protected. And there's a trail connection that provides a loop around the Bixby Park. And lastly, as dedicated parkland, the Measure E site would be limited to park, playground, recreation, and conservation purposes only. And the only way to change that once dedicated is a vote from the Palta residents. Uh, the time frame for action, my hope is, pending the outcome of tonight's discussion, that we can come back next month as an action item for a recommendation to council, and then sometime between December and February, bring the item to city council. Uh, Chair, that concludes the staff presentation. Thank you, Assistant Director Anderson. I appreciate the report and the, the ad hoc uh, group, which consists of myself and Commissioner Kleinhouse, is, has worked on this uh, extensively, as, as you mentioned. Shawnee, would you like an opportunity to comment on this first, uh, beyond uh, what, what Darren said? I know he's not leaving us a lot. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, just a, a couple quick comments I would make, uh, uh, and then we'll open this up to a discussion, uh, or we'll open it up to a public comment, uh, is uh, just focusing on the, the, the fact that uh, Measure E, had a very specific narrow intended purpose uh, for the for the undedication of the parkland and any future use of the site requires will require a vote of the public uh, whether it's rededicated as parkland or not and and those are very strong considerations in in our uh, thought process to, to bring this forward with that, that discussion and and again as as uh, darren has mentioned this is a discussion item this evening uh, we're, we're looking for input and we will be making a taking action on this uh, uh, before the end of the year. Do we have any members of the public would like to speak? And, and before, or, so go ahead. Yes, we do have one, one member of the public in person that would like to speak, Emily. Thank you, our, our first speaker is, is Emily Renzel and uh, you might recognize the name, the, the wetlands right next, next door, next door, have, have share her name. Is it on? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. I'm Emily Renzel, 1056 Forest Avenue in Palo Alto. And um, first off, I would like to say that I tried to drag my friend Enid Pearson here tonight, but unfortunately she had family obligations. But Enid, as you may know, circulated the petition in 1964 that created the Park Dedication Charter Amendment. And that's why many of our parks are still here today. So uh, we should all be grateful to Enid for her work on that. Um, I sent you a letter. I think you all received it. Uh, I agree with the recommendation of your subcommittee. Uh, the uh, rededication was definitely put out there to the voters at the time they were voted as kind of a safety measure that if it isn't used for this, it can be rededicated. So I, I believe in keeping the faith when we make such assertions. And I hope that you will do that and recommend rededication. As a tiny bit of history, um, the um, Bixby Park was a landfill with one lift on it which was about 20 feet off the bay when, when I first came to town in the 60s. And uh, over the time that I was on the Planning Commission and Council, the plan for that park completion was modified three times, keeping the landfill alive much longer. And the reason that was valuable to the city, and I, I don't want this to cut against my argument here, but 
the city was the utility refuse utility was paying one hundred thousand dollars an acre to rent that parkland for the landfill and that i'm only telling you as park commissioners because when you have to buy parkland you're competing with that kind of rent and so it's critically important that every opportunity you have to rededicate or to dedicate lands already being used but not necessarily dedicated as parkland it's critically important that you do that so i'm probably have i run out of time already 20 seconds remaining. oh 20 okay so <laughs> please vote yes on rededication and recommending this to the council thank you <laughs> Sarah, I'm seeing no more hands raised online. Thank you, and thank you for joining us this evening, Emily. Uh, with, with that, we'll open uh, the discussion to other commissioners. Um, Joy, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I know you had mentioned we could go on a tour. I know you, uh, Commissioner Kleinhaus, already did. I was wondering if that's still an opportunity to have all the other commissioners go on a site tour. That's my first. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Commissioner Richard. I've got my colleague, Karen North from Public Works. She's the assistant director. Let's see if she's available. Is that a thumbs up? That is yes, we can arrange for that tour. Thank you. And if the commissioners would just email me that would like that one, I'll help make the arrangements. I also wanted to ask because you talked about the public works not having any other project on that facility, right? Um, what happens to the wastewater or the um, facility there right now? What happens if the park is rededicated? Yeah, that would stay. Okay. Yeah, that would stay. That was there while it was parkland before and it would remain. It's necessary for operations for the, the former landfill site. I see. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I just have a question for staff about the analysis that was done um, in 2014 for the yard trimmings and food scraps that predates Senate Bill 1383. And I was just wondering if staff looked at the impacts of Senate Bill 1383 and the increased uh, amount of compost that would be entering the system, if that analysis still holds true, just for due diligence, really, if that was, uh, if that was reconsidered due to uh, the city of Palo Alto having more compost uh, due to that legislation, as well as other neighboring cities. That'd be great. Let me pop up. You can sit down right here. Okay. Hi, I'm Karen North. I'm the assistant public works director. So we actually have not done the analysis. So I would actually, um, we're, we're looking at our facility. It's a 25 acre facility uh, for the, the wastewater chain plant. It treats wastewater for six communities. We're always um, in need for space. At this point in time, we don't have a, um, a, de a definite decision-making point on what we would potentially do with more space, um, but we do know that we have new regulations coming down the pipeline, so it's always nice to have options open. Um, but I'm so we at this point in time, staff has not have anything right now in the foreseeable future, but that doesn't mean we are not going to be looking for something in the future. I know that's ambivalent, but we we haven't updated it since 2014. Our facility currently is being rebuilt. And so we're currently working on the solid, the liquid process of the facility and not the solid. So we basically did a stopgap measure by removing the incinerator. And now we dewater and haul, it, haul all of our biosolids, which is basically dewatered poop to two facilities just to, to make it easy for you guys to understand. And then we are still trying to figure out what we're gonna do with our biosolids in the future. And now we do need to repurpose it and get energy out of it and use it as a resource. And we have, we're currently doing that offsite, not onsite. Thank you, Vice Chair. Yes, um, you know, as we, we met um, a few months ago and talked about our goals as a commission and we talked about dedication, rededication and dedication of parkland and <clears throat> exactly what uh, Emily Renzel said about the importance of open space and how it doesn't come, it's, it's not, there's not a lot of it 
and who you compete against to, to try to uh, save this open space. Um, I think it's uh, a great opportunity for us uh, to be able to dedicate it, to, to have it as parkland. And so I would be in full support in, uh, in moving forward with this as, as parkland. And so I think it's a, a tremendous opportunity. Thank you, Commissioner Freeman. Uh, yes, thank you, and, that, and uh, thanks for the amount of work that's been uh, done on this. I um, I also support uh, you know, anytime we have effort that is mm -hmm. going to uh, bring in new park land. I'm, I'm I'm all for it. That's one of the reasons I'm on the Parkinson Rec uh, Commission. So I fully support this effort and um, appreciate the effort that the uh, ad hoc and others have done to, uh, to bring this to fruition. Thank you, Commissioner Cribbs. Yes, thank you. Um, certainly, I, I support this effort to uh, do the dedication. Um, I think it's really important and we certainly need to take advantage of all the parkland that we can get. Um, is there a cost um, that we're adding to the city budget and is there staff that will be necessary um, to do anything? Yeah, thanks for that question, Commissioner Cribbs. Um, no, not in just the process of dedicating it, there wouldn't be a cost. Um, further improvements, I think one way of looking at this is by making it dedicated parkland, you allow the use of dedicated funds that are strictly for parkland. Mm -hmm. um, and so it may open up windows of funding opportunities for future development. For example, there's a capital improvement project for Bixby Park the funding for that couldn't be used for that land if it wasn't dedicated. So that piece would mm -hmm. be excluded from the funding as I understand it. Might need to double check that with the attorney, but um, if you're using park development impact fees, I don't know how you'd use that for non-park land. I see, thank you very much. And this could be a place for our uh, suggested grant writer. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Kleinhaus. I think most of anything that I wanted to say has already been said. I think it's time we dedicated the 10 acres. And I think that in the future, if there is anything that would be created there, it would probably be a really viable connection between the Emily Renzel Marsh and the Baylands uh, at Harbor Marsh. And that connectivity is currently underground in a pipe, and we could make it into a really viable um, corridor for wildlife and for people to enjoy if it was parkland again. And funding from the state can be available for things like that and for the restoration of the Emily Renzel Marsh area of the ITT project. So there is a lot that we can look forward to if this is dedicated again. Thank you. Thank you. I, I will just add that, you know, on, on the surface, you know, given the way that Measure E was written, and as uh, as Emily mentioned, uh, it, 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 there was a ten-year window for things to be done. It didn't happen, and if that doesn't happen, then the opportunity is there to to rededicate it as parkland. It, it seems like the obvious thing to do. Uh, doing due diligence as part of the ad hoc, we were really looking for reasons uh, to suggest otherwise. Uh, what, what, what are, what are we what are we what are we missing here? Why sh shouldn't we rededicate this as parkland? We reached out uh, to public works. We reached out to utilities. Um, we came up with no reasons, and for that reason, we are moving forward with the de de uh, recommending a rededication of this. And I think that summarizes things pretty well. And uh, we'll look forward to uh, having this item come back to, to the commission uh, later this year as an action to Thanks, make, make a formal recommendation. Uh, to city council. Thank you. The next, the next item on the agenda is the racket court policy. I think some of you here are inter interest, interested in that. <laughs> And, and I'll, I'll just note that this, this evening, this is a discussion item. So we are talking about ideas. Uh, we are talking about uh, things we are not 
uh, make, taking an action to recommend a, a formal change. Uh, so we have Adam Howard. Uh, and if there are any members of this public who would like to speak on this item, uh, please uh, turn a speaker card into Javad over on the right, or if you are joining us via Zoom, please raise your hand. Uh, given the size of the crowd this evening, uh, we'll see how many, we, we are going to be limited to less than three minutes per speaker. We'll, we'll see how many speakers we have. Adam, when you're ready. My water, yes, please. Thank you. Good evening, Adam Howard, Senior Community Services Manager uh, in the Community Services Department, here to discuss um, the multi-use courts and priority times at the Mitchell Park Complex. I uh, apologize, my max mask just broke, otherwise I would be wearing it. Uh, so tonight I'll just kind of go over um, a brief overview of where we are now, um, show the kind of courts and how they're being used, and then go over some, some data that we've collected and then talk about policy suggestions and get some, some information and communication from the public on that. So just a brief uh, background, um, <clears throat> in 2008, we started to uh, allow pickleball use at Mitchell Park on courts five, six, and seven. It was on a first come first serve basis. Uh, there were temporary lines were installed on the courts. 2019 um, staff and as well as the PRC started to look ways to provide designated pickleball um, in the seeing the growing of the sport. Uh, new courts were designed uh, and courts five and six were then designated as multi-use courts with priority times given to each sport. Uh, the current priority times have pickleball priority from eight to 2.30, seven days a week. Tennis priority three to seven, oh, excuse me, three to 10, seven days a week. Uh, in 2020, the new courts were open. In April of 2022, lights were installed to the two standalone courts, and I'll show you more in detail on this in a minute. Um, but lights were installed on those two individual courts. And in May of 2022, multi-use courts were repainted with yellow lines to improve visibility. So generally, uh, our courts here in Palo Alto, we have eight designated pickleball courts, uh, all lit, all in Mitchell Park. 51 public tennis courts, 17 of which are lit and spread over to three different locations, Mitchell Park, Rinconada, and Pali High School and two multi-use courts, again, Mitchell Park, and those can either be two tennis courts or seven pickleball courts, all of which are lit. So just generally kind of here an, an overview of the Mitchell Park site. The uh, highlighted area there, what I consider the two standalone pickleball courts. Uh, those were previously, I think, handball courts that weren't being utilized. Um, so they were changed over to pickleball to, to, to better utilize those, those spaces. The space over on the right-hand side you'll see is where the designated pickleball courts are and the two multi-use courts are. And then we'll dive in a little bit deeper here. So the highlighted area again, these are two spaces that were created. Um, the fence was bumped out and it was two, two designated pickleball courts. Previously court five, then became four designated pickleball courts. And then what were courts six and seven became multi-use courts. Again, with pickleball priority 8 a.m. to 2.30 or 3 p.m. seven days a week, tennis 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. seven days a week. Some feedback that we've got since these courts have opened. Uh, evening time has become very impacted for pickleball. Pickleball would like to see additional space or evening priority time provided. The grouping of courts remains important for the community aspect of the sport. And there's frustration um, on those courts when two to four tennis players may displace up to 16 players on each court, given the priority times. Some tennis feedback, lit tennis courts are highly important to them. Mitchell tennis courts are the only South Palo Alto courts that are available that are lit. They also mentioned grouping of tennis courts being important to the community. One th common theme, we don't have a problem with pickleball, 
but we don't want to see it at the expense of tennis. And then kind of a common theme, I think, is just the, the issues with the joint use courts. Um, something you hear from tennis is, as we just said, it is hard to go up to a group of 16 or 18 uh, pickleball players and say, hey, I have priority, so could you remove? So um, the, the joint use is not working as well as we thought it would. So we have done just some, some spot checks. Uh, I am open to the fact that this is not every day. This is not every hour. Just times that me or the ad hoc were available to go out and just kind of take a check on the courts. You'll see on the left-hand side, uh, the location. So Mitchell Park, Reconata, Pali High School. Again, we are focusing on lit courts, given that's where the demand seems to be the highest. This first slide are older numbers. These were done back in January. Uh, the yellow indicates places that were completely full at the time, and the green boxes indicate people were waiting at the time. These are a little bit more recent numbers. Uh, these were all included. The only two, the last two, September 23rd and September 24th, I just did, and they weren't in time for the turn in of numbers. Um, so you'll see uh, the addition of pickleball A and B. Again, that is because when we did these counts, those courts were lit. Uh, so it's a little bit different than the previous numbers. But again, yellow highlights the everything is full and green indicates see people are waiting. Um, I also try to indicate with a P or a T if the people playing were pickleball or tennis since courts five and six are multi-use, uh, if they could be used by both pickleball and tennis. So I tried to indicate that, especially when I was the one um, doing the counts. I also at the the very bottom, you'll see a couple of dates that say Pally football, Stanford football, um, this past the 24th event at Stanford, just indicating that getting to those courts was actually quite difficult. On the 24th, I didn't even make it to the courts um, because of the event at Stanford. Uh, so I think it was important to point that out because um, that was definitely going to impact the numbers. So given what we've seen out on the courts uh, and the demand um, out on those priority courts, we thought, is it time to change the joint use policy and the times given? So as staff, we, we provided a couple options uh, that us and the, myself and the ad hoc have come up with, um, with a little bit of pros and cons for each, uh, which I'm sure you'll hear more of from the public here tonight. Um, one option, leave the policy as it is. Uh, priority to pick a ball in the morning, tennis priority in the afternoon, it's a true 50-50 split. Uh, it provides what I would say is their busiest times, but I, I think we'll hear tonight that some of that has changed for pickleball uh, as it grows. Um, this, this option does not consider the growth that we've seen in pickleball. Um, we don't think it accurately accounts for the growth that we've seen in pickleball and, and probably is not the best option, but it is something to consider. Another option would be move away from joint use and turn these courts into single use courts. Um, that could go either way. I think numbers suggest that you would look at making it more of pickleball courts only. I think this might be the best way to address the growing demand for pickleball players. Growth that we've seen even over the last six months suggests if we don't make that change tonight, it is a change that would be coming, um, but it would have the largest impact on the tennis community. Option three, uh, something kind of in between, which would be to provide two, three nights um, of, of priority to pickleball. Uh, this would allow additional growth. <clears throat> Excuse me. This would allow for additional pickleball growth uh, during the week. Um, we could look, we, we originally suggested like a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, where we think the numbers are lowest. But to be honest, there is no low time. I mean, the courts are always busy. So, I could pick any three days um, and there would be, there would be busy from both sides. So I picked Friday, Saturday, Sunday um, in this, in this option, thinking that that would be the best option to grow a community out there. Um, although I think that like, this is the, the middle ground uh, we've a lot of, we, you know, we receive a lot of feedback where this might not be enough. Um, and I also received a lot of feedback that I wasn't necessarily seeing is that the joint use is difficult for both sides. Um, so are we really doing the community justice either side um, by continuing joint use and maybe creating conflict where we, we don't necessarily want some? 
a couple additional suggestions that come up as we have these conversations. So I thought it was best to um, address them now is the, the idea of just adding lights to other non-lit courts. Uh, adding lights is an expense. Uh, it's pretty expensive. So you wouldn't want to do that to one or two courts. You would really only look at uh, groupings of courts to get the kind of best bang for the buck. Um, that kind of lends itself to cover these six courts, which are currently unlit. Uh, but there's there's issues there. One, Coverly's infrastructure, we're, that, that site is basically maxed out on electrical demand, meaning in order to add lights, you have to find either a way to provide additional electrical to the site or bring in, a, bring in separate electrical just to light the tennis courts. So this is a very rough number but it would look like 500 to a million dollars to do a project like that. And that the, that's a huge range, I know, um, but a lot of that just, what is the solution to the electrical problem that we have there? So that is one issue, but uh, the other issue is just kind of the uncertain future of Carberley campus. It's half owned, well, the school district owns more than half of that. Uh, the city owns eight acres. So there's just kind of, kind of an uncertainty about what will happen there. So it, it makes planning, a project of that financial impact, very difficult to do. The other is build additional courts. This would be the ideal solution. Build more space that avoids any conflict between the two interests. Um, there would be financial impacts to that, of course, but just finding that space is a difficult thing, especially given that what you hear from both, both sports is the desire to have groupings of courts. So just throwing an additional tennis court or four pickleball courts into a random park doesn't help the community as much as we would hope. Um, so finding those larger spaces that could really impact both sports is, is difficult. Um, one that staff hasn't recognized um, or found a good solution to. The other option is to dual stripe more courts. This is a difficult one. Um, you know, in, in some, in some, days, I think that's a really great idea. And others, I think it just could add additional conflict, not to mention most likely when, if you dual stripe a tennis court, that's only half the battle, right? That you have to have removable nets. You got to have storage. You have to have volunteers that are willing to set up and remove nets. Unfortunately, there's not a way to dual stripe a tennis court specifically and have them both equally used by both sports. So that that's becomes challenging and how that would actually work. And if, if ultimately it might just cause um, additional conflict. So that's kind of the information I have for tonight. Um, I, at this point, I think I'll open up to questions, comments and, and uh, information from the public. Thank you. Thank you, Adam, appreciate the presentation. Appreciate uh, all the work you've done over the years in, in uh, guiding us through the uh, various uh, uh, changes we've made to our racket court policy and, and accommodating uh, the growing use of pickleball as well as uh, recognizing the needs of the existing tennis community. Before we go to members of the public, uh, first want to ask if any commissioners have any clarifying questions. You said not, uh, this is just a, a question to, related to the content, uh, but not, uh, we'll have an opportunity for discussion and, and more specific questions later. Thank you, Chair. Um, I know you said it's a ballpark number, but it, it reads 100 million. Sorry, oh. 500,000 to a million. I see. Sorry. Okay, I, I, will, I wanted to be sure if I wasn't saying Thank you, well. yes. Th <laughs> thank you for clarifying. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And how many members of the public do we have? We have 21 members from the public in person with two hand raised online. Okay, I'm going to give everyone two minutes to speak. I'm going to ask that uh, if, you, if you, you do your best not to repeat things that other, others have said, if someone has said something that you agree with, you can uh, make reference to that. And uh, we can work to keep things moving more expeditiously in that manner. Uh, and uh, go ahead, Javad, and ask you. So the, the, the place where the speakers will be is, is the microphone right here. That's correct. If we could please, you'll see a speaker list shown on the screen here. And if you guys could please line up in single file order, I'll be taking your uh, speakers one by one, <laughs> speaking here at this chair and microphone. And 
I will call the order. Give me one second. Yeah. He's got the order. Our first speaker will be John Jacobs, followed by Bill, then Monica. John, please approach the microphone. And, and let's get, get to the next speakers uh, uh, lining up so we can uh, keep this moving quickly. John, when you're ready to speak, the microphone's on and I'll start the timer for two minutes. Can I take my mask off? Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Tennis and pickleball can coexist. I'm John Jacobs, a longtime Palo Alto resident and tennis player. Um, <clears throat> retiring from tennis in 2004 when the physical challenges of the sport became too much. Then 16 years later, Monica Williams, an old friend from the Palo Alto Tennis Club, introduced me to pickleball, and as she did to so many others. And I was immediately smitten. There are reasons why the game has exploded. Besides being great fun and great exercise, it's easy to learn, it's accessible to all ages and abilities, and is also a very social sport. I'm 78 now, and I'm really enjoying getting out several times a week to play. I usually play early in the morning to beat the heat. By 8.30 or 9, the courts are typically full. By 10, paddles are down, and people are waiting for courts. Unbelievable. By contrast, Palo Alto's 51 tennis courts are often underutilized, as has been shown by recent surveys. Pickleball players have only one location where they can play, and there's constant pressure on those courts. The most challenging time being in the evenings. It only seems reasonable that the city would try to make this situation more equitable by converting the two back tennis courts at Mitchell to seven permanent pickleball courts, which are now temporary. Shouldn't the greatest good for the greatest number be our mantra here? Even with eliminating tennis courts six and seven at Mitchell, this would still leave four lighted tennis courts within the park to accompany the six lighted courts at Rinconada and the seven at Pali, total of 17. This compares to the 15 total lighted courts pickleball players would then have for evening play. Given the fact that there are lots more pickleball players than tennis players using courts in the evening, that ratio still favors tennis players. Also, the argument that tennis players might have to travel farther to play in the evenings doesn't hold water because pickleball players already have to travel from all corners of Palo Alto to play at Mitchell Park. So that's my take. I love tennis players and pickleballers equally. I really do. Uh, this effort is not to elevate one sport at the expense of another. It just seems like a matter Thank of you, fairness, John. Thank you, John. given the data and what we all see and experience on a daily basis. So, Thank you very much. Okay, I'm, 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 so I'm gonna ask, I, need, I need to ask everyone to I need to ask everyone to refrain from clapping. Uh, it's, it's it's not something that's that uh, appropriate to be done in this. Uh, there's I, I know this this is is people people like to display their pressure their pleasure at something, but uh, it's something I ask you not to do. And we want to keep things moving. We have a lot of people to speak this evening. And Bill's up, followed by Monica and Christian. And I'm also going to ask you to adhere uh, to, to two minutes, since we do have so many people who would like to speak this evening. Thank you, Bill. Please turn on your mic before speaking, Bill. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bill Ring, Ring with an E, just to confuse you. And you're taking up my precious pickleball time. <laughs> I noticed that when things were happening, it was e mornings for the pickball, evenings for the tennis, because in the old days, it was just nothing but us old farts. Now you go there in the evening, you see Stanford med students, it's all ages, young and old. And so the, a lot of times morning isn't good. Afternoon after work is better. For bang for the buck, Four courts, one tennis court. You get a lot more, lot more people in your community doing what they want to do. Um, I noticed, and I I understand the tennis players saying, "Well, this is our only southern part of the city." Well, you know what? We only have one spot. We don't have any choices. We have, we get to go, I shouldn't say have to, we get to go to Mitchell Park. So distance shouldn't be, and like I said, Stanford students are there all the time. So with all your wisdom, 
I say whatever you go for, you go for it. If you don't want to convert one of the tennis courts to pickleball courts, you're doing what you're supposed to do. But I'm sure if you do that, you will then provide pickleball courts in every park in Palo Alto. And I'll help you to do that if, you, if that's the course you want to take. Thank you for your time. Uh, excuse me, please. Uh, I'm going I'm to ask you. Well, this is the last time I'm going to ask you to hold back applause. If, uh, if further applause, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. Um, Monica, you're up next, uh, followed by Christian and Nolan. Thank you. So good evening to Ag Greenfield and commissioners. I'm the president of a nonprofit Palo Alto Pickleball Club. It has been five years since the Palo Alto City Council presented us with a proclamation honoring pickleball in Palo Alto. And a lot has happened since then. Our club has grown to over 800 members and more than 50% of them are Palo Alto residents. Our club has funded over $20,000 to improve courts at Mitchell Park, including the purchase and installation of LED lighting and a new gate during the pandemic to allow for a safer flow of people. We also are proud to be affiliated with the Friends of the Palo Alto Parks. And who would have thought five years ago that pickleball would be identified now as a future Olympic sport? Of course, his popularity has presented some problems, and that is where to play. Five years ago, it was popular mainly with retirees who only enjoyed, enjoyed daytime play. But now more younger people than ever before are playing the sport and play weekends and evenings. On one recent evening, there were 16 people waiting for one court. This, has caused, this it was caused because every day at 3 p.m., tennis players have priority on the multi-use courts which removes the availability of seven temporary pickleball courts, which would accommodate 28 players. Unfortunately for us, we have no other choices of courts besides Mitchell Park. Therefore, we are requesting that you approve option two, allowing pickleball play seven full days a week and leave the configuration of temporary courts as is. Now that you have striped in a brighter color, the, the, court, the temporary courts, they're easier to see and players are happy. We understand that staff feels it's better to transition slowly and to make sure the space is fully utilized before any dramatic changes. I believe from the city survey and an independent survey that we all know that these pickleball courts are fully utilized. In respect- Thank you, thank you Monica. Thank you. Our next speaker will be- uh, uh, uh. Please do not clap. Our next speaker will be Christian, followed by Nolan, then Paige, Zach, Max, and Isabel. Good evening. My name is Christian Sue. I live with my family in Palo Alto. I am 15 years old and a sophomore at Pali High School. Last year, I became the very first president of Pali Pickleball Club at my high school. It immediately skyrocketed with 21 people all loving to play. The club usually meets Monday after school from 4 to 5.30 at the outdoor basketball courts, which luckily have painted lines. We use high quality engaged paddles as well as portable nets from the school. Everyone seems to really enjoy it and they try to make every meeting. We also work closely with different pickleball companies to get materials that help the club grow even more like Paddle Tech and Selkirk. Near the end of the school year, my club was so sad to see the club end and how much fun they had. So we made plans to continue our meets over the summer at Mitchell Park. Unfortunately, the courts were often too crowded so we would struggle to find places to play. Sadly, the majority of my club were seniors and they had to leave for college after the summer. However, their love for pickleball hasn't stopped. 
They are starting their own pickleball clubs at their colleges, helping the sport grow. And Pally Pickleball just recruited 19 new members for 2022 and 2023 Pally Pickleball Club this school year. Pickleball is great because anyone can get started, and I love help pe helping people grow their game. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right. <laughs> Nolan Sue, followed by the Cooks, followed by Jennifer Schmidt. Thank you. Go ahead, Nolan. Hi, my name is Nolan, and I am eight years old, and I have been playing pickleball for 10 years. <laughs> um, <laughs> our whole family has. Our whole family plays pickleball, and I like to play doubles with my dad. We have met many new friends through the pickleball club who we like to play with every week. The only thing is that we have to wake up earlier and earlier since the courts get very crowded at Metro Park during the weekends, and it's very crowded after school. I also like to play tennis and golf. Pickleball helps me with my other sports and is more social. Everything is so expensive these days because of inflation. So it's nice to find something that we can do as a family that doesn't cost a lot of money. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Paige, Zach, Max, and Isabella Cook, followed by Jen Jennifer Schmidt and Tom F. Do I need to touch anything? You're good to go. Good evening, commissioners. We're the Cook family. And if you can't tell, we're also here representing the Palo Alto Pickleball Club. We moved to Palo Alto just a year ago, and we were uh, instantly enticed by the offerings of Mitchell Park, the library, Magical Bridge and whatnot. But then we heard the magical sound of the pickleball pop. And then I found out that there was a free getting started lesson taught by Amy. So we all jumped in and took it and we were instantly hooked. And we rely on a healthy exercise to manage a medical issue for one of our children. And pickleball has been what brings the four of us together between 3 and 7 p.m. The only time the only time we have to play pickleball as a family is after school. And we've been kicked off by tennis players. Uh, we've been kicked off by tennis players who want to um, play at the Mitchell courts. <laughs> And it's sort of disappointing because when we want to like finish our games, they still have the priority. So they're able to kick us off. Key tonight that you've heard from the proposals is the issue of Coverly, where I'd like to draw attention. We are uh, struggling with the lighting issue and the funding and the future status. But for the, for the present time from 3 p.m. until dark, the newly surfaced tennis courts at Coverly is where we go when we get kicked off. So that is the resource the tennis players still have until dark to go to. Um, and unfortunately that's where we've had to retreat to sometimes when we get kicked off. So I'd ask you to fight the big fight um, with the other agencies to work out the status of Coverly going forward to make sure tennis gets lighted courts there if that's available. In the future, I know the city is also studying adding restrooms and other facilities at Coverly that would support that. But I would ask and our family would ask to uh, turn the Mitchell at least from 3 p.m. until dark into pickleball priority uh, to keep families coming out. Thanks. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Jennifer, followed by Tom, and then Peter. Good evening. Um, first, thank you so much for the pickleball courts that we do have. Um, I'm a 15 year resident of Palo Alto. My husband is a 25 year resident. And I also started playing at one of those getting started um, sessions taught by Amy and fell in love. And that was two years ago. And I've made so many great friends on the pickleball court that I would never meet within our community. And so it is a very, very special place. But unfortunately, the current capacity of the pickleball courts in Palo Alto is a very limiting factor. And it's gotten so busy that my husband and I, for the last six months, we don't play there anymore. It's often four on, four off, and it's just not a good use of our time. So we've gone to other cities. We've gone to a private club. Um, we don't go to Mitchell Park. Sadly, I would love to play there more and 
you know, if we expand the access or the amount of pickleball courts within Palo Alto and the start of taking those temporary courts and turning them into pickleball court priority seven days a week from 8 to 10 p.m. would be a great start. Thank you. Thank you. Tom, followed by Peter, then Matt. If Peter and Matt could please line up here, ready to speak next. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tom Follader. I founded Pickleball at Mitchell Park in 2013. Uh, it appears that Adam didn't know we were using six and seven for three years because we moved over there in 2015, and I have receipts for uh, nets and tapes to prove that. <laughs> I'm giving you this background because the mission back then was to provide seniors and tech workers with an easy to approach physical activity that had a social component. The city joined right away in 2015. Uh, and I think that we have traveled that journey and, and certainly made our goals. In 2018, I addressed the committee and I said that there were uh, uh, 1.2 million pickleball players in the United States, but we expected hyper growth. So today there are 5 million pickleball players in the United States. So I started thinking about what, what could have caused that type of hyper growth, which was far greater than what anybody predicted. And it's COVID, but it wasn't the COVID process. It was coming out of COVID. As we were, moved to remote work, people were feeling isolated and they weren't getting enough physical activity. So they sought out an activity with a social component like pickleball, and that's what really drove this, the sport. This is really more of a social conversation than it is a conversation about any physical activity. Uh, it, the other interesting thing I found was that pickleball growth uh, in Palo Alto has actually outpaced pickleball growth nationally. And I think that's because we use a just come as you are uh, drop in philosophy uh, where Take yesterday at three o'clock, I decided to go to Mitchell Park. I did not need to call anybody and say, hey, let's go. Uh, I didn't need to reserve any courts. I just showed up. I had a great physical activity and a great social experience. And when I was walking back to my car, this is what I thought. Oh, Jim. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so we have Peter followed by Matt and Jay. Uh, just one uh, comment uh, related to the last speaker, and that is that uh, just the amount of joy and, and laughter that you find at the pickleball court, it's a, a real uh, uh, counteraction to the uh, uh, mental effects of the pandemic. But I really wanted to speak about another issue, and that is the issue of safety. I happen to uh, be playing pickleball on one of the uh, temporary courts. And I went back for the ball and I hit the net, the tennis net, with enough force that uh, I took a backward somersault over the net. And I think that uh, what's necessary is not uh, a shared use of the courts, but a specific de designation of those courts for pickleball and uh, the uh, putting up a uh, the sort the same sort of fences as on the other uh, pickleball courts, which would be a little bit higher and would not uh, produce uh, a situation where somebody could go, which which I did uh, a backward somersault over the net uh, that uh, was quite scary. Thank you. Next up is Matt, followed by Jay and Chris. All right. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your time today. So I'm about a three and a half year resident of Palo Alto's downtown uh, north neighborhood, just a few blocks from here. Uh, that makes me about a mile north of the tennis courts at Palo Alto High School. And if I keep going down Alma Street, I can be at Mitchell Park in just about 12 minutes door to door. Um, and I consider myself incredibly lucky to have such great access to such uh, wonderful courts. However, I do face the obstacle that I work a full time job. Um, and so what does that mean? It means that if I want to be able to play, uh, 
in the evening, that's often very difficult because of the congestion. If I have a light day and I can shirk some of my responsibilities, decline a few meetings, I can get out there at four or 4.30 and that's wonderful, but often I can't do that. And as you've heard from lots of speakers today, the situation at seven or 7.30 is often almost untenable in terms of waiting, playing half the time or a third of the time that you're there. Um, so much so that it can actually be very discouraging to people who have full-time jobs or not that I have a family to take care of, but having those responsibilities as well can make it even more difficult to participate in the game. And so I think the idea that pickleball hours are early in the day is a misconception that just goes back to a previous time. Um, and the fact is pickleball just has so much to offer uh, professionally aged people. Um, and that speaking for myself as someone who moved down here shortly before the pandemic, and various injuries kind of stopped me from playing sports I used to participate in. Um, finding pickleball um, over the last few months and the level of community and the level of, you know, just being outside and getting lots of exercise and having lots of fun um, really just has been incredible for my social life and my health and my athletic life. Um, in particular, I just want to talk a little bit about how I started playing pickleball was that I just showed up at Mitchell Park. I bought a paddle. I showed up. I barely knew the rules. I couldn't have been that much fun to play with, but a lot of more senior, more experienced players were willing to take the time to kind of show me the ropes, teach me how to play the game. And now I'm a lifelong addict. I'm probably going to be playing in 30 years. Uh, and so I just want to caution people, though, that the late night situation when the courts are so crowded, that gets people a little bit less in the charitable mood, a little more focused on their game. I think preserving the ability of pickleball to grow for players there to have an abundance mindset and want to share the game with everyone. We need to kind of avoid the current situation um, where there's so much scarcity late at night. So thank you. Thank you. Next up is Joy, followed by Chris and Jocelyn. Good evening, everyone, uh, dear commissioners. My name is Joy Zhang. I live in Midtown Palo Alto. I'm a working mom with two young kids. Uh, so playing pickleball twice a week is essential for me to keep me healthy, both uh, mentally and physically. Um, so due to my busy schedule, I can only play for most of the time in the evening. And as the sports grow, it becomes harder and harder for me to find a game during evening time. Um, so where there are usually over 100 players sharing the eight permanent courts with the multi-use courts. So when the tennis players come in, they take over the courts and it becomes worse. Um, and sometimes um, during some evenings, I can only play two to three games between 7 to 10 p.m. So that is really not a good use of my time, but I don't have other choices. And I love pickleball. So that's the thing. That's the only thing that I can do during evening time to keep me healthy and happy. So please, please help me and uh, many other players like me to make uh, pickleball a priority for the multi-use course. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Next up is Chris, followed by Jocelyn, then Amy. Hi, my name is Chris Coopy, and I'm a 20 year resident of Palo Alto. I drive approximately three miles to Mitchell Park, sometimes twice a day. Pickleball is only available at Mitchell Park. Tennis courts are everywhere, however. It's about two and a half miles from Mitchell Park to the Palo Alto High School courts, where there seems to always be availability of some sort at night. The temporary courts at Menlo Park are needed, mostly used for pickleball every night. We play until the tennis players come, as everyone has said, and you know how the two courts will displace 28 players. You've heard all this. I personally couldn't be someone who came onto the courts and displaced 28 players so I could play, but it happens. I get that Mitchell Park is convenient for many tennis players, but if I have the burden of driving three miles to go to the only place in Palo Alto to play pickleball, why can't a few tennis players drive two and a half miles to Palo Alto High School and only if Mitchell Park is full. It's still better that for them than it is for me. Give pickleball these courts full time. It's unfair that I would have to drive for nothing because pickleball is overcrowded, just so tennis players can, can have convenient courts to walk to because they don't wanna have to drive. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Jocelyn followed by Amy and Mosh or Mosh. Hi, I'm Jocelyn Sang, and I've uh, been a resident of Palo Alto for over 20 years. Um, I am here to uh, talk about a couple of things. One is that we do a lot of programming uh, for the community, the pickleball community, to uh, enhance 
um, just community building and um, you know creating uh, ties among um, our players and um, also to celebrate together uh, for just you know on a on a um, on a, a monthly or weekly basis and it seems to me that it's very difficult without uh, having uh, the priority of the courts um, on the on on the nights afternoons and nights to be able to uh, build the same type of community um, that we do during the day we do so much programming that we just are unable to do because uh, after 3 p.m. Um, you know the mixed use courts becomes priority for tennis. Um, in addition, we also can't do programming for youth. It's been a, a hope of mine that we can uh, do after school programs, but we are always told, you know, it's already so crowded. And if you plan anything, you can be kicked off at any time. And so that is the reality for a few years now, we've been talking and talking about doing youth programming, but we've been unable to do it because we just don't have the assurance that we have access to courts. And what courts that we have access to are so overused that it, it's, you know, you just can't take them over and try to do something um, for kids or for after school programming. And finally, I, I just wanted to emphasize that you know, what's happening now at night is that there are so many pickleball players that there are oftentimes people um, waiting and waiting. And so when a tennis, when two tennis players or four tennis players come, they are displacing so many people all at once. And it's not displacement where, you know, if you're rotating into a game that it's 20, it's, it becomes an hour or so before the courts are, are freed again. Thank you. Thank you. Next up was Amy, followed by Moshe and Helen. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, I'm Amy Lauterbach. I've lived near Mitchell Park for 35 years. I'm the Amy. I'm the Amy that does the getting started programs that a few people referred to. Um, I get very nervous speaking, so I'm just going to read. Um, we pickleball players are thrilled to be part of a thriving, diverse community where every Palo Alto resident can come to the park alone forge new friendships with people of all ages, all abilities, all languages, all cultures, and all levels of income. Those words come straight from the Parks and Rec Master Plan. That guiding principle is completely in alignment with what pickleball is about. People come alone. People have referred to the, how pickleball um, prevents social, social isolation. What I ask of you is to step back read your master plan guiding principles and take a strategic look at the best way to deploy those two courts, those blended use courts. There's magic happening at those courts. The sense of community is impossible to describe. So I ask all of you, come play pickleball with us. Come out to our <laughs> courts and play pickleball with us. Everybody in Palo Alto is welcome and encouraged to come see what's happening there. The next seven speakers are gonna second my invitation to come play pickleball and they'll be very brief. Thank you again. Thank, thank you, I mean, next up is Moshe and Helen and Khalid. Yep, I'm Ma Suzuki Moshe. coming from Japan and you know, come play pickleball with us in Japanese. Ishoni pickleball shimashou. And we Japanese show appreciation and gratitude by saying arigato. So arigato to all pickleball community. Arigato. Next is Helen. Helen followed by Khalid and Herb. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Helen Wall and I was born in Hong Kong and I moved here in 2010. So it's 12 years now. And uh, please come play pickleball with us in my mother tongue, which is Cantonese. That is, uh, <laughs> Thank you, Khalid, followed by Herb. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing in Indy. That's fine. I, I will be pronouncing my name again. So my name is Khalid Kazi, and I'm from India. 
and Palo Alto has been my home for 20 years now. Aye, hamare saath pickleball khili. Tal walabua pickleball maina. Pickle uh, amader shong pickleball khilar ashu. So those are the three languages: Arabic, Bengali, and and Hindi, across ten different countries. So I invite all of you to experience the magic that Amy talked about. It's it's real for me. Thank you. Thank you, Herb, Indy, and Bianca. Well, uh, Herb didn't show up. I'm okay. Oh, I'm Herb. Nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I have a very difficult name to pronounce because it's not, as you can imagine, I was not, I did not grow up here. So I usually go by HP. Um, so I was born far away from in the galaxy, um, 15,000 miles from in Mauritius, small islands. Uh, I think there was, there's 2 million people in the world, Mauritian people. Grew up in France and moved here five years ago with my two girls that are playing tennis and I want them to play tennis. So I'm a, I'm a former soccer player, tennis player, and turned to pickleball. Uh, I enjoyed myself playing basketball three years ago, and um, I asked, I need to get back to do something. And my physical therapist told me, you know pickleball? Oh, I know pickleball. That's the thing you play on the beach. I say, oh, well, you, that's the only thing you can do. So I say, okay, I'll do it. I do it it's three years ago, and I'm still playing pickleball every day. As you can imagine, I'm too young to retire. I, all, although I like to retire next year, but it's not gonna happen. So I can only play during the evening. Um, and, and to me, given the, you know, the, the, the number of people playing pickleball in, 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 um, in, in this area, it's almost impossible to get a good games. Uh, good game means you have one, you play two, three, four, and you don't have to wait 30 minutes and very soon it's going to get cold. Um, so I think I enjoyed myself, uh, last year of why waiting, you get cold and then you need to get back into it, et cetera, et cetera. So please help us. To me, I would even go for option one, which is give that, you know, five, six to pickable and make sure the tennis players have light uh, where they need to have light so that they also enjoy their sport. Uh, again, my girls are playing tennis. I love tennis. I'm too old, even though I look young to play tennis anymore. I'm injured everywhere. So pickable, it's good for me. I meet a, lo a lot of people here I did not know a year ago. Now we exchange, we discuss, and we have fun all together. So thank you. Thank you, Indy, followed by Bianca and Beverly. Hi, everyone. My name is Indy Ting, Indy like Indy 500. And uh, I I'm, I'm, was born in Taiwan and I moved to Palo Alto in 2014. And now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say uh, welcome to play pickleball with us in Mandarin. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bianca, followed by Beverly, and jo then we'll move on to the Zoom speakers. Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Blanca, Bianca Guerrero. I was born in El Salvador, moved to the Bay Area in 1981. I never played any racket sport before. I came to Palo Alto Mitchell Park <coughs> and Amy introduced me to the sport and I cannot stop playing anymore. So if you want to keep all people like me active, uh, it's hard to play in the double lines courts because we are losing our sight. So, <laughs> so it's a, all the lines, yellow, white, and it's, it's confusing. So if you can convert those to full pickleball courts, that will be really great. So in Spanish, I'm gonna tell you, bienvenidos, Vengan a jugar pickleball con nosotros. It's a fun game. <laughs> Thank you, Bianca. Beverly will be our last speaker in person. Okay. Uh, my name is Beverly, and um, I am a longtime resident of Palo Alto. I've been here for 60 years, and um, I'm so excited that they started. Uh, pickleball. I've only been playing for a year and a half, but it's the best time I've ever had. And I'd like to second what Amy said. I'd love to invite everyone here on the commission to come play because you won't regret it. It's, it's the most fun you'll ever have. Thank you. Thank you. 
Juval, do you want to manage the Zoom speakers, please? Joseph, you've been unmuted. Please speak when you're ready. Hi, yes. I'm Joseph Fong in a Palo Alto residence. I feel that staff and ad hoc committee recommendation of splitting the evenings between tennis and pickleball is wrong and not justifiable. I'm the author of a comprehensive survey conducted last year on the utilis utilization of the lake courts. My survey was conducted over 14 consecutive evenings with an established methodology. The data were analyzed and recommendations were made as a result. I will not go into the detail of my survey at this time. I just want to say that my study shows that pickleball should have the court priority seven nights a week. The self, the self survey do support the finding of my survey. However, those surveys are not sufficient and you cannot use it alone to make a decision. They lack a scientific methodology, lack adequate data points, and lack an analysis of data. There's no data in the survey to justify splitting of the week between tennis and pickleball. I urge this commission to use real data to make your decision. If the staff does not, does not have the time to conduct a thorough survey, hire a consultant to do a proper and credible one. At the minimum, have a qualified expert go over my study and incorporate its finding in your decision making. Please do, do not make subjective decisions based on incomplete data or personal opinion. I urge you to do your due diligence and make an informed decision with supporting data. Thank you very much. Gerald, you've been unmuted. You have two minutes to speak. Unmute, thank you. You're I'm two Jared minutes Anderson. Of uh, can you hear me now? Yes, please go ahead. Well, thanks. I won't repeat what's already been said, but for all the reasons already mentioned, I'd simply encourage the city to convert the multi-use course at Mitchell Park to dedicated pickleball courts. Thank you. Hello, I'm done. Lavender, you've been unmuted. You have two minutes to speak. All right. Uh, dear Commissioner, my name is Lavender. I've been living in Duvernac neighborhood uh, since 2010. I believe the city should provide more pickleball core hours during the evening time as the pickleball community is experiencing exponential growth. Um, I personally discovered this game in January. Now my whole family is playing, including my teenager son from Pali. Um, my son also formed his own teenager group and has been playing in uh, Mitchell Park uh, at night regularly. I can tell you how happy we are to see our kids stay away from YouTube, video game, and social media. Um, additionally, I have recently uh, hosted our 58th block party on our street. Um, the club has graciously allowed me to borrow their net so I can set up a pickleball play uh, for our neighbors on the street. And it was a big hit. Uh, three working parents and uh, four school kids love it so much and they follow up with me immediately and uh, ask where they can play more. The Pickleball Club at Mitchell Park is truly a special place to build a strong local community. However, due to uh, the schedule constraints, they can only play during evenings and weekends. Thus, uh, my request for your support is to have more dedicated Pickleball hours during, the, uh, during those times. Thank you for your consideration. Grace, you've been unmuted. You have two minutes to speak. Hello, everybody. My name is Grace. I'm here to support Pickleball has a priority seven days a week as a mom of a teenager. Just like Navinder said, um, this summer I persuaded my son to join me, initially just because I want my son to spend less time on the internet. I found Pickleball is one of the best things that happened to us. 
My son is a high school freshman. He can only come at night and weekends due to school and homework. Sometimes we have to wait for two games until we could play one. It's quite a waste time for him. Playing with my son was one of the best experience for me. I also highly recommend other parents use this as a way to bond with their young kids, just like Christian and other family who previously spoke. Nowadays, teenagers spend a lot of time on devices and social time. I mean, social media. Pickleball suits for all ages and the best tool to bond with families. Actually, my son and I have signed up a couple of tournaments together in the past months. It was one of the happiest time when we got a medal together. I definitely hope more juniors can play pickleball and the city can support them and provide more time and opportunity for them. Pickleball is not a game only for senior people. It is for everybody. We need more course time. Thank you, everybody. That's all. Chair, we have one more in-person speaker Thank filling you. out a speaker Thank card right now. Thank you, Javad. Look forward to that. And that will be our last speaker of the evening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Yang. stories you no know, i understand how much you love pickleball but this is as much i love tennis so i don't want to you know invade into other people's um, benefit so i think the best uh, solution is build more dedicated uh, pickleball courts and uh, the commissioner mentioned this is the cost effect right it costs like half million to one million dollars but i think in palo alto is, is a rich city right it has the resources resources to build those courts it spent millions of dollars building those uh, so-called traffic improvement projects, right? There's a total waste, right? And then it makes traffic even worse. So I think those money can be better used, right? So everybody can be happy. Okay, thank you all. That concludes public speakers. Thank you. Thank you to all the members of the public who've uh, come out and, and, and had, had an opportunity to share their their opinion with us, and and their it's it's always a uh, good for the commission and and the boards to hear from the public directly. And this is a a, a, per, a great uh, opportunity for public engagement. So I thank you for coming out. We'll now turn to the commissioners uh, for uh, their comments. I'd like to start with the ad hoc committee uh, who's been working with staff on on the recommendation, and uh, would like to hear from them first. Is there someone who'd like to start? Ann, please. I guess I will start then. I was going to jump in. Oh, were you? No. Go ahead. <laughs> um, well, well, first of all, um, I have been working on the ad hoc, but just this year, and this has been going on for, for quite a while, um, I have a couple of thoughts sitting here. First of all, I am a huge supporter of exercise of any kind, and I think it's so great to see all of you who are playing pickleball. I also think it's great to see people who are playing tennis. I am so happy to see people coming out of COVID and doing things that are active and important, both for physical and mental health. So I applaud everybody. Um, I also want to applaud the staff who spend a lot of time thinking about how to, how to reconcile this. I mean, it's a big issue. And all you have to do is read the Wall Street Journal and read the New York Times and read Sports Illustrated to see that pickleball is growing and pickleball is having growing pans and people are fighting with each other. They're paying money for, um, for uh, matches. Um, and there's all sorts of stuff going on that I don't see yet in, in our community. And so I think it's really great, Adam, that you and the staff had spent so much time thinking about how to make this right and fair for everybody. So thank you for that. Having said that, my personal opinion um, is that we need to make those two courts that are multi-use single courts for pickleball. That would be what I would support, even though I think it's not an option tonight, or maybe it's just a discussion. Um, I, I at first um, 
thought that we could change the priority, but I think there's so many opportunities to have friction between uh, and the multi-use courts and being a, a senior person and having eyesight issues too, I think it's better not to have those um, yellow lines on the courts. So anyhow, I would hope that we, we could get to the point that um, that could happen. But I also would like to say that, um, we have a lot of resources in this community and we're very fortunate. We are an incredibly blessed and fortunate community. And I would encourage us to look for a solution. Um, I know it's gonna be challenging to the lights at Coverly for the six courts and see if we could get a definite price and then proceed to create a plan and raise the money to make the lighting work, either temporary lighting given the state and condition of Coverly or permanent lighting. So I will let um, my other commissioners talk. I think I've said enough. Thank you, Nellis. I, I want to um, thank all of you as well for coming out and expressing um, what is something that's very passionate to you. Um, I myself um, have dabbled in the art of uh, pickleball as well. <laughs> uh, being a former racquetball player, um, uh, I, I, I understand your passion. Uh, this is also a sport that is not going to go away anytime soon. Uh, I think as the numbers have sort of uh, popped up as well, it's the how this is just, the, you know, it, it's, a, it's an elevation. And for this city uh, actually started off early uh, being behind pickleball. And so um, I want to also uh, reach out to Adam as well for the, the work that the staff has done in trying to stay ahead of this. It's not something we can just make a decision about and it's going to just stick the way it is. It's, we, it's, we've got to be nimble. Um, we've got to, you know, it's, it's, um, it's being able to kind of um, dance on both sides. We, we've got to a community of, of people who are passionate about tennis and others who are passionate about uh, pickleball. And we need to, make, to address both as, as, much, as quickly as we can. Um, don't want to see anyone getting turned off by, you know, coming, I understand having to wait for a long time, get, get in, play one game, and then you've got to wait for another three or four hours. You used to have to do that in racquetball. It wasn't, wasn't fun. So, um, you know, especially if you're coming out to, to really exercise, you're coming out with your family, it's a family sport. And so uh, being a uh, part of the ad hoc, I, I totally support that effort. And uh, like Ann says, we, we, we will work with the city as, as, and with you guys as much as we can to try and reach a solution because it's, it's something that needs to be addressed. So I, again, just uh, really appreciate everyone coming out expressing yourself, bringing your family. Uh, don't give up on us. I mean, we're going to make this work for everyone. So, so thanks again. Thank you, Mandy. Yes, thank you to everybody for showing up uh, this evening and especially thanks to staff for doing the work um, and getting the research to tee this up. Um, lovely to hear the stories um, and hearing especially um, for those who gave up your pickleball tonight, um, I apologize for the impacts um, and, and the kids that probably are missing homework or something. Um, thank you very much for showing up. Uh, I understand the, the injuries and the switching from tennis to pickleball. Um, my dad had tennis elbow and then he started playing ping pong, got ping pong elbow. And I'm sure he would have gotten pickleball elbow if he had done that and then somewhere in between. Um, especially sympathetic to the uh, working hours that have been expressed this evening. I know that that is very difficult to balance everything else that's going on in your life, including getting some time for yourself and a social activity like pickleball. I don't think that uh, good policy is always simple policy. However, I do think that in this case, simplicity is of the utmost importance for the use of the court just to make it uh, easy for newcomers, which it, it seems like is as fast as a sport is growing, um, to make any court usage policy as simple as possible and not intimidating to, to new people. 
I apologize that government cannot move as fast as pickleball grows. Uh, it is impossible. Um, but I do believe that Palo Alto has been responsive uh, to the needs of the pickleball community in Palo Alto historically. And again, big credit to staff for um, making adjustments to the policy and the commission commissioners before us and that are currently on here uh, for, for being responsive. That is, uh, again, difficult to make government move that fast, but I think that they have done a very good job of building trust between us and this community. Um, I So as the demographics of the sport change and the demand changes, I do think that it's important that we continue to look at this policy. And I think it will have to be, my. it's my opinion that it would have to be a, an iterative process. And I would like it to be more of a group project approach between the two sports. Um, and so uh, in looking at the options that are prepared by staff, I would almost uh, propose a three-tiered approach moving forward with the ultimate goal of converting the courts to dedicated pickleball to solve some of the safety considerations we heard tonight, and as well as making the courts more inclusive for those uh, in terms of visibility of the lines. So working towards that as the final end goal, um, I would say the next step before that would be pickleball priority so with a substantial amount of the week or maybe seven days a week. Uh, there are additional costs that would go into that conversion of doing the painting and the removal of the nets. Um, and then I would say as an initial step uh, that we could explore in modifying the policy is giving priority potentially four days a week and then in, uh, immediately looking to our fundraising partners in creating a joint goal of uh, lighting coverly and raising the funds to do the conversion of those courts. So once those two goals are met, then moving forward with any additional policy measures. So that's my um, feelings right now, but open to hearing the rest of the commission. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. Uh, Joy? Okay, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I wanna appreciate everyone for being here today. Um, just to see the passion, the stories, and um, just to re-echo what Commissioner Krebs and Commissioner Freeman said, I, my personal opinion is the spirit of equity, um, just like you also said as well. I think it's wise that we do a tiered approach. Um, not just, yes, I agree that the two courts should be you know, moved to um, pickleball, but at the same time, I think it's also necessary to hear um, the other side for, for, for the tennis players. Um, my own stand would be to be more focused on seeing how we can have those six cuts lit. And just like you said, um, Commissioner Cribs, thinking about how we can work with the funding partners to be able to make that work. And like you said, also, it's not as fast. It's not going to be as fast as we want it to be. Um, but I think it's a great step in the right direction. Um, I just want to appreciate everyone for being here. And I hope that we'll be able to resolve this um, as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Oche. Shani. Um, well, very compelling and passionate testimony here tonight. Thank you all. Um, I have some questions for staff, I guess. Um, are there pickleball courts in other communities around us? Uh, yes, there are. There are Menlo Park, Mountain View, Foster City. I think Verbit City just has indoor courts. Um, they're growing everywhere. Okay, thank you. Um, I was wondering if there is a way to use some of the parking lots that are not used at night, like a Cumberly. Oh, apologies. We have parking lots that are not used a large part of the time. You know, sometimes during the day, maybe on weekends they're used, but mostly they're not used. Coverly has huge uh, parking lots that there's nobody there at night. Can some of that be used? Uh, the parking lots are currently owned by the school district. So we would have to have approval from them to do that. Uh, it's not the best playing surface either. So I would have some concerns about just the ability to really play any sport on, on what's current parking um, the current conditions of the parking lots, specifically at Coverly. Okay, thank you. 
So overall, I think the need is clear. It's not, we haven't heard from the tennis players. I'm not sure why they're not here. Uh, maybe they're a little intimidated, I don't know. But uh, I would like to hear from them as well before we make a decision. Um, but I tend to agree with the other commissioners. It looks like the need is great and the community definitely benefits from having those um, a pickleball courts. I think it will be important to keep some level of flexibility into the future. And my very somewhat strange concern is with a proposed project right next to these pickleball fields. Um, this, the city is building what is called Mitchell Park Place. It's housing for people with um, intellectual and developmental disabilities. And I'm a little worried about noise and the response of some of those people that have those level, those kind of disabilities. So I, I don't know exactly how that would work out, but it may be that in the future, we may want to put some kind of a sunset on, on, a, con, on a conversion of time. So I'd say three, four years and then look again, given that there will be another community there and I don't know what their responses will be. And I'm a little concerned about that. That's all. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Lemaire. I want to thank everyone for uh, coming out tonight. Certainly a very passionate group and uh, to hear about the connections people make and um, what pickleball has brought to them. And it, it seems like there's certainly a need uh, for pickleball courts uh, and for people to be able to play the sport. Um, and so it's a little bit of an equity issue in terms of what we have available for pickleball players uh, versus the, the tennis courts available. And, uh, you know, one thing, Adam, if you could talk a little bit about is perhaps what it takes to site a pickleball court and maybe what might be some impediments to put a pickleball court at, say, Hoover Park or some other park and what, what sort of obstacles we might face with some of those decisions versus what, uh, where we have existing tennis courts. Yeah, thank you for that question. I think it's important. Um, there's a different sound that's associated with pickleball. And so I think when you choose a location, um, the surrounding like neighborhood is most important, how close a neighborhood is, uh, you really would not want it anywhere near an, uh, housing or, or neighborhoods. Uh, I know there was an article recently about a, a court in, in um, Berkeley that was basically had to be shut down because the, the, the neighborhood noise. So location is super important for that regard, but it also, as you've heard, it's a very community event. Um, so you need parking. You wouldn't want to put this in a small neighborhood park uh, because it's going to draw too big of a crowd at one time to, to be able to house the parking, which is one of the reasons it really organically grew at Mitchell park. I mean, some of them had mentioned it was not, uh, on the staff side saying to go there, just people kind of naturally ended up there. Uh, and it has the, those two things going for it. There's a lot of parking there and it's not directly surrounded by neighborhoods, um, people of living situations. So it is an ideal situation and staff, we've looked at other parks, other locations, uh, and we haven't really found one that's like, would sufficiently find the size plus is away from neighborhoods that we wouldn't end up just causing a nightmare for the people that live around there. Thank you. Um... I'm not a member of, of the ad hoc, but I do want to make sure that uh, we have heard from the tennis folks and we, we've talked to them and, and uh, because we are taking something from someone. And, and I realize we have a demand now and things change. And that's what we all have to understand is things do change. But we also have to realize we're, we're, we are taking something and, and, and something that people had, had used. Um, I do think that with this, it, it just, it underscores the importance of Cumberly and what are we doing with Cumberly and what are our conversations with the school district and what are we thinking about with that space? And so many discussions that we have, and it's not just pickleball and tennis, but they come back to Cumberly. And so I think it just really underscores uh, to us and to the city trying to really uh, think about Cumberly 
and think about the future of it and, and engage in some deep conversations with the school district. And, and it's been, we, we've, we've run up into to roadblocks, but again, this is a, another issue um, that, that's, that, that we're looking at Coverly as a, as a solution when we're not sure what the future of Coverly uh, does look like. But uh, I am in support of an iterative process of uh, these courts becoming pickleball courts. But I, I do think we need to keep the, commu the tennis community in mind and just also keep in mind uh, the ability to find places to have uh, lit courts as the demand for uh, playing these sports in the evening uh, grows. And we've seen that with this is not just a, a pickleball or a tennis issue. It's, it's soccer and, and other sports as well. So um, thank you to the ad hoc for working on this. And, and thank you to everyone uh, showing their support and being very engaged uh, in our community. Thank you, Vice Chair. And, and thank you again to everyone who's come out and, and, and spoken this evening. Uh, a, a special thanks to the young members of our community who have spoken this evening. It's always a great experience uh, to get out and, and speak in a, in a civic forum. I, my, my children did this and, and it's a paid, paid good dividends for, for them. And I encourage uh, other uh, young members of our community to, to speak before this commission and other uh, uh, opportunities to speak before city council and uh, commissions uh, in the city. I, I, there, there's obviously been a, a lot of vocal support for pickleball this evening. I, I think to me, it, it, it's, it's clear that eventually at, at some point it makes sense for five, all, for all of the, the courts by the Magical Bridge to be dedicated full-time to pickleball. I think it's really more of a discussion of, of when and, and how we get there. Uh, and, and that's complicated as, as many people have already articulated. Uh, when staff was initially talking about the options that we have uh, uh, outside of the, the, the uh, alternate options such as Coverly, um, my first reaction is that's, that's just a non-starter. It's, it's, it's so complicated uh, given the uh, uncertainties associated with the environment there. It, it is the ideal location. Uh, there's the, uh, there's the, the physical challenges of, with, with power, uh, but anything that would be done there would be essentially temporary given the, uh, the, the redevelopment uh, that's got to be happening at some point in the area. So one question I have is, is uh, would the use of solar lighting be a possibility for the area, even uh, something that could be, uh, I'm not necessarily suggesting renting the, the solar units as, as is done on a temporary, temporary basis at, at Coverly uh, at the stadium for evening soccer practices, but could some sort of a installation of solar lighting be put in place that would be reusable uh, at, at a later date uh, when, when, when things are redeveloped? So something I'm interested in, in, in staff to explore. Another question I have is, along the transition, is there any consideration for dedicating court six now to full-time pickleball uh, and leaving court seven as multi-use? Is it, is there, is it, from the tennis perspective, is it important to have uh, the two, two courts uh, together? Uh, is that a factor? But that, that's, that seems like one suggestion that I haven't heard that, that seems like uh, could be worth merit. Uh, I, I appreciate the uh, the wait time and ex and exercise conundrum that people have. Uh, I mean, that's just just one of the, one of the factors that adds adds up and, and uh, is, is compelling for the reasons why we need to try to figure out a way through this. An another good I idea that I heard a member of public mention was considering uh, pickleball uh, priority until it's dark. I know that would be more complicated from a, a staff perspective and for the public understanding perspective since the time of day that gets dark it varies from season to season, but we, we figured out how to just um, open space closing, uh, open and close hours and, and we could, we, this could be done. As, that, that seems like a possibility. Uh, the, an, another item that really resonated with me is the that we're not able to offer any kind of youth programming 
at the at the pickleball courts or, or for pickleball because there is no guarantee that uh, the courts will be available uh, during the hours when youth would use it. And I, I think uh, that kind of goes hand in hand with my previous suggestion of potentially, uh, or what someone else has previously suggested in terms of keep, keeping the pickleball, pickleball priority during daylight hours. Uh, so again, this is a discussion item this evening. We'll be back again later this year uh, with an action recommending a specific change to city council uh, to the racket court policy. Uh, and that, that's something that, that we'll be dis discussing further, but I, I, I've offered some ideas that I think that staff could pursue, a lot of good ideas from other commissioners. Uh, would any commissioners like an opportunity to uh, add something? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the, 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 the opportunity for public comment is, is over at this time. We'll be, you'll have an opportunity the next time the, the subject comes here or you can speak during oral communications. Uh, and, and, and as Vice Chair had mentioned, it, it would be good to hear from the tennis community. Adam. Thank you, yeah, so I just want to address that. Yeah, and I agree with, you know, getting the input from the tennis community is more difficult than the pickleball community just because of the dedication of the club and the kind of cohesiveness of it. Uh, I did, you know, send this notification to the Palo Alto Tennis Club. I did send it to my email list, which basically entails anyone that's emailed me about tennis, I've kept and I sent that to that list. Uh, and then I physically put um, notifications of this meeting on the Mitchell Park. You know, I highlight laminated them and put them on the courts, um, which is really the best way I know all the ways I could think of as to kind of get to the individual um, tennis players. So, so it's a little bit more difficult, I think, to reach a larger grouping, um, but that's kind of the steps I took to try to get input. Uh, I know that the commission received a lot of emails. Um, the tennis ones came specifically to me. I think they didn't realize too to include the commission. Um, there were five of those. I did send them just before I got here so that you guys were aware of that feedback that I got in that regard as well. No, I, I appreciate that you're doing what you can do. And, and we do have members of the tennis community here this evening, but they've, they've chosen not to speak. Uh, and so hopefully we can hear more directly uh, from them in the future. Joy, Commissioner, Commissioner Oche. Thank you, Chair. I'm more concerned about um, notifying residents of you know steps we take from today i'm um, carrying everyone along what would be the best way to communicate that so everyone is aligned that's my question yeah so i think i would take similar um steps right any kind of any kind of notifications out on the courts themselves uh any anyone that's emailed me and and really that's why this i think this meeting was so important it was kind of like making sure that there was public notification of these conversations taking place, making it as public as I can, because I, I want the public's input. That's really why um, I make these, these, these steps is because I want to get public input. Um, but I'm with you that I've done the steps that I kind of know of, but any, any additional information or communication chains, I'm, I'm open to them. Ellis. Yeah, I just uh, support what uh, Adam just said. We, in meeting as uh, as part of the ad hoc, uh, was to really really make sure that we reached out to pretty much everyone, the you know, the tennis and pickleball, and so uh, and that was you know posting uh, the information on the tennis courts. I forget when you did that, but it it was a while back, so that everyone you know pretty much everyone's had the same opportunity to. Um, you know, participate in the forum. I think all the information went out um, as far as uh, the, the notices on the tennis courts um, and uh, reaching out to the different groups, including the email group. So I'm, I'm not sure how much more effort <laughs> could be done on that, but uh, it, uh, that's, that is one of the things that, uh, that we definitely wanted to consider as, as far as the uh, ad hoc working with the city on that. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for coming and joining us this evening, and uh, we look forward to uh, uh, further discussion and, and action on this topic in, in the near future. Next uh, item on the agenda is public art 
for the Bulware Park Improvement Project. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good evening, commissioners. Looks like you still have a bit of a crowd coming out of uh, the meeting room. My name is Elise DeMarzo. I'm the director of the Public Art Program. Thank you for having me this evening. Um, I wanted to have an opportunity to talk a little bit about the Public hey, Art Program. Elise? Yes. Do you mind holding on just a minute? We we can't hear you in the in the room just yet. That's fine. Why, why don't yeah? While I'm closing the doors. Sweet. Yeah. Thanks. We might want to encourage them to take the conversation outside if you don't mind. Elise, thanks for the patience that we can now hear in the in the room a little bit better. And Chair, would you like me to introduce Elise? Yes, please. All right. My Welcome. pleasure to introduce Elise DeMarzo. She's the Senior Program Manager with Community Services Department. And Elise, uh, welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me this evening. Um, sounds like you had quite the crowd um, in the meeting room. Always good to get public feedback. Um, so I'm here to discuss public art for Bullware Park. Um, if I could just share my screen, I have a presentation I should be able to pull up. Can you see my screen? Yes. Great. Thank you. So I wanted to just introduce a little bit about um, the public art for Bullware Park. We were at the very beginning of the process and I'll talk to you a little bit about how public art funding works and what the process is for our CIP projects. Um, and then I'd like to solicit some feedback from you um, about that specific site and any particular um, stakeholders that we may want to reach out to in the course of design development or issues we may want to be aware of at that particular site. So for municipal public art projects, I've pictured two recent installations here. On the left, you've got Sway um, at the Junior Museum and Zoo. They're 40 foot tall rideable pendulums. I hope you've had a chance to visit them. And um, there is an overlook on the Highway 101 bike and pedestrian bridge uh, by Mary Lucking. So the uh, city of Palo Alto has had a percent for art in municipal projects policy since 2005. Um, in 2015, the, um, the policy was updated and an ordinance was enacted to change the way that that funding structure happens. So essentially it happens um, with the budget cycle every year. So as CIP projects and the budgets are approved for parks, for fire stations, for other projects within the city, 1% of that budget is set aside in the art and public spaces budget. So we're able to take those funds and allocate them to various projects. So, if you look at the list here, CIP projects are identified as part of the budget cycle. So we're able to see those forecast out a number of years. Um, to initiate a project, we go to the Public Art Commission as we have for Bullware Park um, to establish a budget for the project. In this case, it's a $90,000 budget with a 10% um, contingency. Um, we gather community and stakeholder feedback, some of what we're doing this evening, also looking at the feedback that was given as part of 
the Bulware Park um, outreach with Peter Jensen and of course with Darren and his team. Um, from that, we're going to initiate a call to our artists to identify which ones might be appropriate for this particular project. We hold a selection panel, which typically is uh, seven members. We have one public art commissioner. Uh, usually we have the landscape architect or the architect for the project, um, community members. We would like to have a representative uh, from the Parks and Recreation Commission. Um, and we have local artists and stakeholders. That selection panel makes a recommendation to the public art commission for the artist. That artist gets approved by the commission. And then we bring them into contract to do concept development. And that's where we really have them walk the site, meet with the neighborhood stakeholders, um, give them a much better picture of what happens at Bulware Park, who's there, what might some of the behaviors be that we want to um, maybe discourage or encourage there. Um, and so we work with them on concept development the Public Art Commission, once they approve the conceptual design, then we get into detailed design, fabrication, and installation. So um, here we have, um, you know, the, the plan for Bulware Park. And at this stage, because the public art is a little late to the game on this, um, we certainly do not wanna do anything that will change any of the use of the park that's been identified through all of this community outreach. Um, there are quite a few opportunities that, um, that we've discussed might be feasible. And we wanna stay back from the Matadero Creek um, space there because we don't know what that future may be. We don't wanna throw any footings in there or anything that might um, limit future use. So in this case, we're looking at potentially integrating artwork into the basketball court. And I'll have some examples of different kinds of projects, not the exact artists we're looking at. Um, there's a number of fencing areas, the shaded tree and picnic area. Of course, there's a restroom building. There could be a couple of related pieces that could work um, incorporating the restroom building. There's the tree-lined walk that um, intersects with Chestnut Avenue, there could be something that's integrated into the walkway there. Of course, the, um, the Chestnut Avenue drop off could be an interesting space to explore. And there's a number of existing sort of gates and fences for various use where artwork could be integrated, but without changing, um, changing those installations. So let me give you a little bit of a picture of what kinds of things we're looking at, and my mouse is very touchy, I apologize. So for uh, basketball court examples, and if you Google artist designed basketball courts, it's amazing what's out there, there's a lot. Um, so you see everything from um, artist designed backboards to in the center a partial court or full court coverage. Um, here you see different examples, of course, um, some cover up more of the traditional markings in the um, backboard or not. Um, on the left, you have um, a Bay Area artist named David Huffman. We have actually one of his murals off California Avenue. Um, two of those projects are um, from Memphis, Tennessee, and one in Virginia Beach. So here's Venice Beach and Carson, California. Um, a couple of different artists who have done uh, full courts there. On the left, you have uh, a couple of courts in New Rochelle, New York by Scott Albrecht. And on the right, um, a couple of projects in San Diego. I also mentioned um, there's a new ADA crosswalk that's supposed to attach the court or the um, I'm sorry, the park to the neighborhood. And there's lots of really great artworks that have been incorporated into um, crosswalks, streetscapes, drop-off areas. Um, and if you haven't seen the study through Bloomberg Philanthropies, it's really interesting, the um, asphalt safety, what they're finding and um, how well these methods have mitigated um, impacts between pedestrians and vehicles. Yes. 
And then here we have um, some examples of sidewalk embedded artwork. So on the left, Modesto, California, clearly something that's um, more musical. Uh, the mosaic there is an example out of Hayward. And then on the right is an example out of Calgary. So just because I had mentioned um, seating and railing areas, um, the left is Beatrice Koran. It's a fence with, um, with architectural glass embedded. That's in Cleveland. And then on the right is um, a seating structure called Tunnel Vision by Janine Centauri in Los Angeles. Well, that is unfortunate. See if we can get it to come up. I am having a little technical difficulty on my last couple of slides. I think we can see this if we scroll to the attachment uh, in the agenda. We we can see the pictures. Okay, so if you, if you can just refer to them from memory. So there are a couple of other um, examples there of a traditional um, sort of off the shelf bike and pedestrian bridge that has been refreshed by artist um, Vicki Scurry with the bright pink railing and additions of, um, of, uh, of plexiglass. And then there's seating and shade structures by Mary Lucking and Matthew Geller. Um, and then toward the end, play structures, if we wanted to do something creative that was playful, um, Colin Selig with the, uh, the big red creature on the left, um, Creative Machines, who has created um, light and sound interactive drums for parks, and Joyce Sue, thank you. Um, so we're on, yeah, on the next slide. And then Joyce Sue on the right, going very big and whimsical, probably bigger than we went for this particular site. Um, but I wanted to throw them in just to sort of give you examples of the kinds of things that people are doing in parks and um, just sort of get you thinking a little bit about that. And so there are a few questions in particular as, um, as you know, you give your feedback on the, uh, the public art process or public art at this particular site. These are some of the things that really are helpful as we look to um, give direction to artists about what, um, what that environment is like and what we might want um, the artwork to communicate. What are some particular themes? Um, what is that neighborhood really like? Um, and I think that's it. So we're open for questions or comments at this point. Well, well thank you, Elise, for for joining us and, and, and thank you for, for engaging us on, on, on the subject. Uh, it, it's great to have a, a collaborative a, a approach to uh, working to find some appropriate public art uh, in, the, in, in our parks. And a lot of the examples you, you've shown us are really kind of uh, fresh and vibrant and exciting and, uh, and, uh, and, and interesting. So, uh, Look to see if any com commissioners have any clarifying questions before we go into our comments. I, I, yes. Yeah. Thank you for the the presentation. I do have a a quick question. Uh, when we say we paint something as art, say a backboard or a basketball court that has a lot of use, what are our rules or responsibilities towards that piece of art as it ages, as it you know, does it, does it get repainted or, or what do we do with it? I know um, in other situations with uh, more permanent art, there's rules about moving it and so forth. Um, what, what do we do with things that are painted? That's an excellent question. Um, really the best practices in the field have moved um, away from things like murals or painted um, scenes like that, whether it's the, the courts or whatnot. Uh, from being permanent. So essentially when we draw up the contract, we have an estimated lifespan, which usually would correspond with when is that court need, going to need to be resurfaced? And at that point, we would make a decision about um, how to proceed. If we were going to resurface the court because it was due for that, and perhaps it's an opportunity for a new artist um, or how we want to handle that. 
but certainly in murals. So for instance, if there was a mural on the, um, the restroom and or the basketball courts, that would be something considered long-term temporary, but not necessarily come into the collection. Thank you. Thank you. I, I had a, a similar question re related to that. Uh, just part, all, all, the other part of the question is how long do you expect the the mural would last on something like a so, something so vibrant on something on like a basketball court that gets a lot of wear? And uh, how long would you expect that's going to last? Um, that's a good question. I think it would probably last quite a bit longer than things that get put in the, um, the streetscape or crosswalks simply because you have more vehicles that are driving over them. Um, but that's really something we would need to, as we get into design, work with Peter Jensen and the contractor and see what the lifespan is of that port surface and what the best paint material is going to be. Thank you. Other commissioners want to, Nellis? Yeah, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, one question is how do, how do you make, do you, how do you make the decision where the art itself will be, I guess, staged? And I guess in making that decision, I mean, do you select the location first and then go out and figure out what art is needed? And do you reach out to, uh, maybe to the residents of that community to find out kind of what their thoughts are in, before placing that art? Great question. So um, the way the, the process works is we've identified a few different areas where art might be incorporated into this park. Um, it's really difficult for an artist to make a meaningful um, proposal without having come to meet with the stakeholders and really do that in-depth research. So they eventually make a proposal for what type of art and where it would go based on that stakeholder uh, feedback and research. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Another quick question, Elise. Were you asking for a member of the Parks and Rec Commission to be a member of the seven person selection panel? Um, we will want to reach out. I mean, if anyone's interested, certainly put your name in the hat. I'd love to know who might be interested to serve. Um, we want to make sure that the selection panel is a really diverse group of people that we don't have all one age group or all male or all female. So um, I'm hesitant to say, you know, this particular commissioner is the person, but if you are interested, I would certainly love to know um, who's interested in getting involved with the process. I will also qualify it with one of the most challenging things about serving on a selection panel is you're selecting the artist based on their previous work. So you're not seeing the artwork you're going to get, you're looking at their skill set like a job interview. So sometimes that can be a little bit of a difficult leap for some panelists. Thank you. Appreciate the answer. Uh, Commissioner Kleinhaus. Uh, in your uh, questions, you asked about just input in general. I like the idea of having uh, some art at the Chestnut Avenue drop-off area, uh, and less so in areas that are, are in the in the native plant uh, or native tree garden. Um, and the other thing, and I don't know how how you tell an artist, like if there's any specifications, but generally I worry about light. And mm -hmm. so if there is a specification that, you know, uh, put some limits on certain, or, you know, uh, transparent surfaces, things like that, that could hurt birds. So I don't know how, like if you say that you don't know what you're gonna get ahead of time, then maybe you have a few guidelines that would be important. Thank you. Thank you. Elise, did you want to respond to that at all? I'm not sure there's a question there or not, but if you have something that you'd like to add, please do. That's the, that's something we always take in mind with any installation. The, the lighting for the artwork has to sort of work with the rest of the building and the same light pollution regulations that the rest of the, the project has to adhere to. So 
that's something we're always mindful of. Um, my guess is we're not looking at a sculptural object that would be uplit, right? Because we're looking to integrate into what is already designed within the project and to integrate the art into that rather than creating a standalone object. Commissioner Archer, sorry, trying to go ahead. Follow up on that. I think the park is expected to close its, at uh, the end of the day, right? When the park closes? All, all the urban parks close at 10.30 p.m. 10.30, okay. That's not what it says on the website. It says sunset. Oh, that's true for some of the open space preserves, but the urban parks have a 10.30 p.m. close time. It's in the Muni code. Okay. Commissioner Ocha. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I am interested in the selection panel. Um, I don't know how much work will go into it, but I'm interested to know. And I also wanted to find out if um, some of the artists you'll be working with use like safe recycled material. I've seen some parks where they, you know, find a way to be able to incorporate recycled material. I'm, I'm just wondering if we could incorporate like sustainable materials into um, the public art. I don't know if it's something that your team is considering or part of the previous work that the artists may have worked on. I think that is something we can always enter into conversation with the artists about. In fact, the last slide I had with the play equipment the large red um, creature that people can climb onto. Those are made by Colin Selig, who also did a number of the benches on University Avenue and they're from upcycled propane tanks. So, um, so that is something that we do keep in mind, but we don't keep the artists to that it has to be um, something that's upcycled or recycled. So, so thank you. So at what stage do we, um get feedback from residents? Once the artist is selected and that goes to the Public Art Commission at a public hearing, then we engage the artist in a design development uh, contract. And so that's when we're able to do more outreach and they get to meet with more of the stakeholders. Let's see. Thank you. Yeah. Does the community have, like the people who use the park have any input into when once the design is selected, if they like it or not? Um, well, they're part of the design, the outreach process. So that informs what the artist does. And then they have the opportunity, they can voice if they have any um, support or lack of support for it, certainly when it goes to the Public Art Commission for approval. Mandy? And well, just along those lines, I'm just wondering: Does it ever happen that um, a piece of art is placed in a park and the community has a violent reaction, or is, is it all agreed upon beforehand? You know, we really follow best practices in the field, and this is the way it's done. Um, and knock on wood, if I can find some around here. Um, <laughs> We, we've had very good luck. So, I mean, looking at some of our recent installations at the Junior Museum and Zoo and actually the Bike and Pedestrian Bridge, we've gotten quite a bit of fan mail regarding those installations. Well, just given the conversation I was just speculating about, does, does, that, ever, does that ever happen? I'm, I'm wondering if all the agreements with the artists, are they different? Are they tailored to what's being produced or are, are there, are, is there a form that you kind of follow that's best practices? Um, good question. The artist agreements are somewhat different because public art, there are some um, different legal implications. Mm -hmm. There are protections for their copyright, for instance, that are mm -hmm. in those contracts that are not in other ones. Um, so it is a little bit different, but we're, we've been doing this for a long time and, um, knock on wood, have had a pretty good track record. Well, I really appreciate all the information that we yeah. learned tonight. It was really great and fun to see all the colors and how the colors interact in the pictures. So I really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Nellis. Again, thank you for um, thank you for the uh, presentation. Um, I yeah, I don't have any other questions. Is this um, how, how? I guess I guess one question would be how often um, are art placed in different parts of the city? Do you have a, a particular schedule? Uh, is it once a year? Is it and or and how do you make a decision as to making sure that a particular neighborhood park is um, sort of uh, getting their fair share of, uh, of artwork? Great question. Um, generally, the artworks that we place throughout the city um, that are not associated with a construction project are temporary in nature. So for instance, in the past two years, we've had um, 50 uh, art lift grant projects that have been installed throughout the city, temporary murals around the public safety building. We've had eight murals there, four additional ones in the Calab district, four downtown. So most of what we place that is not associated with a construction project is temporary in nature um, because our parks and our open space you know, the use of those spaces is so highly coveted. Um, it makes more sense when it's a larger project and you can really engage everyone in a conversation about what might be appropriate there. Um, when we look at the forecast for upcoming uh, capital improvement projects, um, you know, I reach out to my, my colleagues here and say, you know, well, what is the scope of that project? Does it make sense to integrate public art here? Does it not? Um, might we be able to pool some resources? So for instance, the budget that was allocated for the 1% for this particular project was not particularly high, but by pooling a few projects together, then we're able to get a significant enough um, budget to do something at this site. And we wanna make sure that we are allocating it in South Palo Alto in different locations and not just the same spots over and over. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Jeff? Nothing about the basketball courts? <laughs> I do. Actually, I do. You know, I, I do have uh, one comment. I do appreciate the basketball courts and, and the art there. Um, and then uh, I also appreciate the temporary art. And uh, this is maybe a little bit, this does not have to do with a park, but there was a small pedestrian bike bridge on Bryant Street that mm -hmm. uh, someone installed uh, some temporary art there. And I think mm -hmm. any, any place that we are able to do that at times, it does add something to someone's walk or something to someone's day uh, where there's something a little bit different or, or something artistic. Um, and I uh, just thought that was a really nice touch and uh, do appreciate everything that you're, that you guys do uh, for our parks and for our city um, to give it the, uh, the culture and to give it uh, something a little bit different for, for your eye to catch. And, and it, it is appreciated that, that we just don't uh, look out onto, onto concrete and it can um, blend in with the nature as well. And, and certainly do appreciate what uh, Shawnee had mentioned about uh, the groves and, and keeping some of the, some of that um, the nature nature. Mm -hmm. So, but thank you for what you do. Thank you. Um, thank you again, Elise. Uh, uh, you did pose some questions for us, and one of them was, are there any particular behaviors or concerns to be aware of? I, I do know that there has been some past history of uh, some concerns of inappropriate gatherings in the, in the back corners of the park, and so we would just want to make sure we're not uh, putting up something that would in encourage something like that. And I think staff can provide uh, more information, details to you regarding that. Uh, as far as the assets of the neighborhood, one thing that stands out to me clearly is, is Matadero Creek, which is, which is running right through it. And with respect to a, a particular theme for artwork, it seems like the, the natural aspect, or the natural, her natural heritage of Matadero Creek or potentially some sort of a indigenous use or symbolism uh, relating to the history of the area it could be a, a potential theme for some artwork. 
I, I love the uh, the vibrant colors of, of the basketball courts and stuff, as I mentioned before. And it, it seems like if there was some tie in between the basketball courts, the uh, a mural on the restroom, uh, streetscapes and crosswalks and something like that, it seems like there's a, an opportunity for a, a lot of things to, to flow from that. And uh, wanted to ask if there are any other commissioners uh, besides besides Commissioner Oche who would be potentially interested in participating on the selection panel. Uh, so, Darren Elise, would you uh, be in further contact with Commissioner Oche re regarding participation? Sure. That? Yeah, I'd be glad to connect uh, Commissioner Oche with Elise. It'd be great to have some representation from the commission uh, and uh, further our, uh, our relationships. Uh, and I, I know that the uh, collaboration between commissions is something that city council has, has expressed an interest in uh, uh, recently, as, as well as uh, over uh, over the years, and so anything we can do to, to further that is, is great. Uh, but uh, that's that pretty much summarizes my comments. Does anyone have any follow up comments or questions? Well, th thank you again for uh, joining us. Uh, thank you for uh, wait, waiting out our our previous item and uh, and. Uh, sharing your part of your evening with us. Appreciate the input and uh, the, the helpful answers to our questions and uh, look forward to hearing more about uh, how to uh, brighten up uh, the experience for everyone at Bulwer Park. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, we are now back to the Department report as being the next item. All right. Thank you, Chair. Darren Anderson with Community Services Department again. Uh, recruitment update. We're still recruiting for our vacant park irrigation position and now a budget analyst position. That's unfortunately a new vacancy and still recruiting for our senior management analyst, also still vacant. On the positive front, we have two offer letters going out this week for our two vacant park ranger positions. So that'll be exciting to fill those. Uh, recently, we had the Palo Alto Fire Department and Santa Clara County Fire host a wildland fire training up at Foothills Nature Preserve. This was last week, and several of our open space staff were able to participate, which is great learning experience. So not only does Palo Alto Fire and County Fire get to learn the preserve a little bit, which really comes in handy with area familiarization, and there's also just good fire firefighting technique practice. So they do, got to do things like progressive hose lays and things that you typically the rangers would not get to practice. So it's great to have those bigger organizations there to help with the training. Uh, tarantula migration season has begun, which is really interesting and fun. Every fall, the North American tarantulas can travel anywhere between an inch and a mile. These are the male tarantulas. They reach maturity around seven or eight years old, leave their nest and go in searching for a, a female. Um, so they'll travel and you can see them up at foothills on trails and roads and, and different areas of the preserve. Um, and then they die after this <laughs> very brief two week journey. Uh, females usually live longer, closer to 20 years and they're staying in their, in their burrows. Um, since last month's department report, we haven't had any additional fish death, um, as a result of the red algae bloom that's, um, has been plaguing San Francisco Bay. So that's been good news. Um, doesn't mean it hasn't happened, but we have not found them. Uh, similarly, there haven't been any additional reports of dead or sick birds from avian influenza in the Baylands, which is good. Uh, we did have the 11 that happened right as it was sort of peaking in our area. However, on that topic, the avian influenza, the JMZ just announced recently that it's removed the birds from its public viewing area and canceled all bird interaction programs until further notice, just to protect the birds. The risk to humans is really low, but the risk to birds is high. So to replace its bird activities, the zoo is offering interactive zookeeper talks throughout the day. And I'll keep you updated as I learn of any updates and changes. I imagine they'll be watching that very closely. 
The Environmental Volunteers are hosting a Baylands Bio Blitz on Saturday, October 1st, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. This is at the Baylands Nature Preserve. And a Bio Blitz is basically a snapshot of the plants and animals that citizen scientists come and find at a given day at a given time. Uh, attendees will record all the living things that they see and record it into a naturalist app. And then the environmental volunteers will have um, educators present to assist. On October 28th, between 6.30 p.m. and 8.30 p.m., we're going to have our Jack O'Jaunt Halloween program at Lytton Plaza. Space is limited and pre-registration is required. The community will get to vote on the scariest, cutest, and most creative jack-o'-lanterns as they stroll through the display. Registered workshop recipients, participants rather, will receive one pumpkin and have access to carving tools. And for more information, you can go to the city website uh, for events. Uh, one that I'm kind of excited about, one of my staff members, Mark Ribeiro, had partnered with the library staff to add a new pollinator garden. This is at Mitchell um, Park Library on the second floor terrace. And Juanita Salisbury, who's kind of our hero of pollinator gardens, she helped design it. Um, Mark purchased the plants and planted it with library staff. Turned out really, really great. I think Councilmember Cormack stopped by and maybe even helped plant a little bit. Uh, so if you get a chance, come stop by and take a look. That's our eighth pollinator garden that we've put in with parks um, in coordination with um, Juanita Salisbury and her, her team. Um, and they've done a few additional ones with private groups like churches and things that I'm not including in that eight figure. Uh, the infill at Mayfield Soccer Complex, you might remember last time I updated you on that situation. Since that time, this is on September 21st, we met with stakeholders from several of the leagues that use Mayfield to give them an update, find out um, their thoughts and feelings and keep them updated on the process. Commissioner Freeman and Chair Greenfield both attended that as well. And at that meeting, we explained uh, that we've consulted with three different contractors who evaluated our initial bid. And you might recall, we got we put it out to bid. This is for the replacement of the infill and putting in the new one. And the one bid we got was four times, almost five times what we had expected. So these three other contractors all confirmed, yes, that is out of, you know, this is not like an industry trend that it, everything is elevated. This is out of whack. And we do recommend you go out to bid again. But they also recommended we do a test patch saying that on that north field that's closed, come out there with the machinery that you intend to use. Here's what we recommend and do a test patch to make sure it works A and make sure it doesn't damage the grass blades. So as you take out the melted infill, the rather sensitive grass blades that are left behind can get damaged depending on how aggressive you are with the machinery. And so that's the rationale behind doing this test before we go all in to understand what the implications will be and how it works. We're uh, in conversations we tried already with one contractor who initially expressed interest, it fell through, and we've got another contractor who's putting together a proposal now to do that test patch. We're hopeful this will happen soon, but we don't have an estimated time frame for it yet. Um, the long story made short is after we do that test patch, assuming it's successful, we'll put it out to bid again in an expedited format, not as long as we typically do for bids, probably reduce the timing as much as we can to make it move fast. And we have sought out cooperation from our purchasing um, department to say, this is an incredibly high priority. We want to move this forward. We're targeting late November, potentially early December. Um, part of the timing is predicated on some feedback from the leagues. Chair Greenfield had asked a good question of the leagues. Is there a you know, there might be the earliest time we can get the contractor to do it, but would that interfere with your use of the south field? And would you prefer maybe if we bumped it out a couple days or weeks, would that be helpful? Uh, so we got some initial feedback on that. I think we've got to have some more conversations to understand exactly what the best timing would be. And then the other big caveat is contractor availability. So even if there was a preferred time, contractor availability may dictate a little bit about that and as well as weather, if it, the work can't be done in the rain. So um, that's another factor to contribute into finding the right time. We've also committed to keeping the leagues updated. Adam's working on an email to the, the stakeholders and then also to the wider group to keep them updated on what's going on, as well as the website. My last update is about the 2022 Board Commission and Community Working Group Recognition Event. So that's including our 
commission here. That's this Thursday at 530 at Campbell Gardens. If you haven't received an invite, please let me know and I can make sure you get that. Um, it's something our city clerk's office, I believe, has done the outreach on that. So hopefully you've heard about that. And Chair, that concludes the department report. Thank you, Darren. Do any commissioners have any follow-up questions? Nellis. Yeah. Um, on the um, on the uh, Phil contract, you mentioned one contractor dropped out. Well, he, he was never fully in, but he expressed the a, a that we recommend you do it and B, I can do it. And I said, well, great. You know, we'd love to do that. We call him the very next day and it just hasn't materialized. So you have what to know? Or? Uh, that doesn't mean this person wouldn't bid on the project to do it, but this was specifically oh, for, for the doing patch. the test patch. Gotcha. That's right. Got gotcha. you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Just a, a couple of questions. Um, Darren, could you update us again on the gym, please, at Coverly? You know, I don't have any new information since our last conversation, but I'm working with Kristen right now for our wellness center ad hoc, the one that's working on the wellness center. I spoke to Kristen today about that. She mentioned she had mm -hmm. met with that ad hoc. Um, and where I had last left it was staff was going to do some analysis of Coverly. This is part of our overall um, analysis of well, where a recreation wellness center could go. And one of the potential sites we're thinking about was Coverly. And it's so fraught with all these different potential uses and conflicts and unknowns that I recommended staff help put that together because we might have a little more insight. The more I talked with Kristen, the more challenging that is. There's, even with her greater knowledge and familiarity with the, the latest news, it's still very difficult to ascertain exactly what the timelines are gonna be, what the game plan will be, just really uncertain. So kind of tying in with your general request of what's happening with the gyms kind of feels the same way with the, is this a good site in general? I, I've got more work to do. Hopefully at the next meeting, I'll have some more information for you. Great. If I get something really salient, I'll send it via email to the group. Okay. And then my, my second question is about the Foothill Stakeholders um, group. Um, and I understand it's meeting every two months now. Has there been any discussion about um, the docent program with for the future with um, either the junior colleges or with Stanford for mm -hmm. those plans? You know, we still have the EVs who are running their, their program, the Trail Ambassador program, and they're mm -hmm. still coming up on Saturdays. And that they hope to do a little more on Sundays, as I understand it. Um, and that that's the one that we've asked for their assistance on. You know, do you see this growing? And initially the response was yes. And I think that's still a potential. But right now, I don't see that happening in the near term. I think they're really focused on just doing their own thinking, their own volunteers trained mm -hmm. up and as active as they can. Um, so, so far, I don't think there's a lot of movement on that yet. So would you ever um, entertain talking with um, institutions that are close by educational edu institutions that could help build a program like that? Yes, that was definitely. sort of all that dream. And yeah. I know you guys have been busy with a lot of stuff, but. Yeah, and I think that's the, <clears throat> that's the honest reason why it hasn't happened yet. And it might be a little while since even with um, the hope that you're going to get an institution to take the lead, which would be our hope. Mm -hmm. um, there's still an incredible amount of staff time sure. to get up and running. And right now we're just giving it our all to keep the place running and operating um, the doors you. open, so to speak. I, I would just add that I, I support that idea and, and I appreciate the, the staff bandwidth and resource issue associated with that, but it's also the type of conversation that's going to be medium range uh, term in terms of getting something off the ground. So initiating conversations uh, with some institutions wouldn't be bad if, if there is a minimal bandwidth just to start having some exploration. Uh, it would take a while to get something. Just, yeah, just running. to add into that, there's a really good model down at in Monterey around Fort Ord and all of that with um, a local a local college and so it might be good for at least to have a conversation with if if there's interest i think there's definitely definitely interest i think yeah staff agree and i i know the stakeholders all seem to support the the concept
Anything else, Anne? No, that's it for now. Thank you. Others? Darren, can you give us an update on the Foothills entrance fee? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I had uh, shared with the Foothills ad hoc a little blurb that we were planning on publicizing to start our weekday entry fees. Um, and we were targeting October 11th. And just today, so I was going to have that in my um, department update. And just today, ran into a few more delays with purchasing. So I'm pushing that out a little bit um, and just want to verify a few more things. But it looks like it will most likely be one week later than our original idea. That would be Tuesday, October 17th that we would implement this. Um, we've worked with the chief communication officer in their office to say, here's what we're thinking. How can we best publicize this so everyone knows well in advance, especially all the different free options. So we've been very used to coming for free on weekdays. What are your options for free entry? And there's quite a few. Um, so we just wanna make sure people know before they get up there. Uh, we'd also most likely have a fairly lengthy period of time where the rangers would give warning notices as opposed to citations because it would be something new um, rather not get into too many details so that people aren't just coming up and saying well i know i can have one month or whatever it is without receiving a citation so we might not publicize that quite as much but there will be some leniency especially in the beginning as people learn and get used to this this new trend but it's likely that there will be entrance fees charged at on weekdays at Foothills Nature Preserve before the commission's next meeting. It is, yeah, it is potential. And I'll certainly send out an email to this group and you know, mm. of course, it'll go to council as well. And it'll be in the Uplift uh, newsletter and Ed's announcements um, to city council, et cetera. Signage in the preserve itself and then all our stakeholder groups. Um, so they'll be aware. Thank you. And I just wanted to, mentioned that regarding the, the pollinator garden that's that's really exciting to hear and mentioned to the newer commission members that Juanita Salisbury did do a presentation to the commission regarding yeah. pollinator gardens uh, a couple years ago and so it is in the record uh, we, we can look it up if anybody's interested in uh, watching the the video of the meeting I, I didn't recommend that it's it's, it's interesting and, and applicable and, Chair, could yeah. I just ask one more question? Since you were talking about fees, uh, it spurred my <clears throat> memory. Um, is there an update about the junior museum fees, Darren? There have been press reports about raising the fee back again and all of that. Will we hear something about that before that decision gets made? Or? Oh, I'm glad to share at the next department report, whatever information I've got, or if there's something that comes up in between that time, I'm glad to share it via email. Uh, I'll email John Aiken and ask him right now if there's anything that um, Thank you. would be of interest on that. Um, Darren, when we spoke, you talked about getting interest fees for free from the library. I just want to understand. Yeah, there are, are. So we've got a number of different free options. There are free days. There are six free days of the year where anyone can come in for free. There are um, a multitude of groups like fourth grade students, for example, that fall into the free category. Hikers, bikers are free. Volunteers that are coming in for the day to volunteer at that preserve get in for free. And then there's the library program where we partnered with them and um, they offer a certain number of free passes that can be picked up at the, at the libraries and you can come to Foothills for free. And, and, I'll, and I'll just add on the, the Foothills Nature Preserve website, the uh, entrance fees and the, uh, the free options are, are highlighted and described in, in good detail. It's worth reviewing for all commissioners if, if they haven't done so already, so that when somebody asks them about it, they'll be knowledgeable. Shani? Shani? Um, I have a question about the golf course and the mitigations. Is there any update on that? Yeah, thank you, um, Commissioner Kleinhaus. Uh, yes, the latest is we did get a consultant on, they did a preliminary vegetation survey, and they recently submitted to Laman um, Doe, who's overseeing this, a report that we're going to submit to Brian Wines. He's with the Water um, Board, and we're glad to share that with you and anyone else who's interested in. Um, this will likely be an iterative and ongoing uh, process where we have to raise 
our level of mitigation monitoring because we're behind on it significantly, as well as the amount of effort put into invasive weed management and native planting in the wetland areas of the golf course. And you offered um, a tour and yes. I would still like to do that, please, and anyone else. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind emailing Javad and then Javad and Laman, I'll set up a time to do that for anyone who's interested. So, so Shani's going to email you and then Javad will email it to the whole commission to find out who's interested or? No, no. But any commission who's interested, just please email Javad and then we'll, we'll set it up. Actually, actually, Javad, if you could email the commission and ask for interest so people sure. will remember to email sure. you if they're interested. We'll do. That'd be great. Thank you. Anything else from anyone? Okay, then we're now moving on to our ad hoc committee and liaison updates. Who would like to provide an update first? I mean, I, I mean, all, all the ad hoc, ad hocs I'm on have basically been presented tonight as far as the, uh, uh, with, with the uh, uh, pickleball, uh, which we now know what the progress is on that one. Uh, and from soccer, uh, I think Darren did a good job of uh, kind of letting everyone know what's happening with that. So we have been actively uh, participating uh, with the soccer community and um, you know the, the the importance of getting that back on track and hopefully getting the fields uh, taken care of. I think uh, we might have had a meeting before. Well, I think a couple of weeks ago is when we um, Jeff and I would help uh, helping pick up uh, at the at the various uh, locations the little black balls that were covering the field. So. Uh, the soccer community wants to help as much as they can, as well as I'm sure the pickle, pickleball community. So I think we we have people out there who will do what they need to do to get things back on track. We just have, we need to make sure that we keep them in, involved in the process. So. Anything you'd like to add regarding the electric conveyances ad hoc? Also, more colloquial, colloquially known as the e-bikes ad hoc, e-bike policy. Uh, yeah, we actually did have a meeting on that, and I think at this point we're pretty close, I guess, to making a uh, coming up with the policy, which is another uh, moving target similar to pickleball. So. EVs are growing as probably just as fast as as a pickleball. So it's one of those things that we, um, I think, as soon as we put something out, it's going to uh, need to be a, uh, at least at least put out the the, the, the template and then uh, keep it moving forward as far as an active uh, an active engagement. Yeah, the, the ad hocs met a couple of times. And the last meeting was with members of the transportation department, and we got some good feedback from them and. We are looking to uh, present to the full commission as a discussion uh, next month, and uh, we're on target to recommend an action uh, this year, by the end of the year, uh, which is what we signed up for in our master plan. So we want to get to that. Other updates? Um, just following the dog park discussion, we've met with stakeholders um, from the dog park group and staff is evaluating opportunities for a pocket park somewhere in North Palo Alto. Uh, this is requiring quite a bit of research on staff's end on deed restrictions and working with planning and working with utilities. And so a little bit of legged work going on in the background, but um, trying to be responsive to the community's needs. Great, thanks.
others. And anything on the uh, funding opportunities? On the funding opportunities, yes. Uh, we, following on the report that we talked about at the last meeting, um, we now have an ad that is just about ready to go into the Enjoy catalog that everybody has taken a look at. I'm waiting for one more approval before I send it to Darren. Um, and I think it looks good and it's a great opportunity, I think, to be in a hopefully a quarterly ad, Darren. Um, we also provided copy for the website that we're meeting on next week to hear what we can do and what we can't do. So that's a step forward. And then we're developing the final communications for community um, meetings when there is a community meeting about a park or about another opportunity when residents would like to get involved, how they, how they can give and where they can give, working with both the Friends of Recreation and um, the Friends of the Parks. So that's moving forward. We're hoping that the ad hoc will dissolve after um, that. Also, sure, it sounds like Vargas. Oh, I just wanted to um, acknowledge the ad hoc for that, how quick that was and how much work went into that really by themselves and came back with a beautiful page for the you know, the enjoy. Um, I feel frustrated that I would love to help more, but you guys didn't need it and you just <laughs> took care of it. Uh, so I just wanted to acknowledge you and thank you very much. It looked great. I'm excited to make some headway. Good, thank you. Great. Others? If we're to the liaison reports, yes, chair. Yeah, okay. absolutely. So I was um, invited to come to the to go to the youth council youth advisory committee um, retreat at Mitchell Park uh, two Saturdays ago. I followed uh, council member Stone, who um, spoke to all the youth in the room, and then went off to the 49er game. Um, and uh, I was so pleased to meet the new group of. Um, participants. They're great, all very passionate about the world and the city and activities and mental health and act all. It's great. We're really fortunate to have such um, incredible young people. And we saw some tonight um, in Palo Alto. And so it was, it was a real treat for me to be able to go. So. Great. Uh, the park dedication uh, ad hoc is, is also uh, been been working. Uh, obviously, we, uh, we discussed that earlier today. Uh, anything else before we then move on to talking about uh, questions, comments, future agendas? Any comments or questions before we move on to talking about next agendas? So Darren, next month, we're looking at uh, the e-bike policy discussion. Yes. We're looking at a action regarding park dedication for the Measure E site. Are we on board for youth council next month? Yes. I, I, I confirm with that. Adam. Great. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, so the, the, that's probably a, a, a full agenda. Uh, urban forestry will need to get in in November for uh, the, the annual update. Uh, some of the question mark items are the advanced water purification system. Will that be coming back this year? Do you expect, Darren? It's hard to say. I We asked Public Works and they were uh, undetermined. But I would I would guess that, yes, they would be back before the end of the year, or at least want to so if they want to you need to impress upon them that they need to let us know soon so they can get scheduled in or yeah. they will not have the, an opportunity i did share that and i yeah. haven't heard back yeah. yet well thank you sure and how about uh, bccp uh yes i'd also like to get that back in before the end of the year okay and then uh, in November, we will have the CIP review. Uh, so you, in, 
next month we start when will you be ready to start meeting with the cip ad hoc yeah i'm the check in with lom and get back to you on that one um typically we wait for the office of management and budget our omb staff to say okay now we're embarking citywide on a capital plan project here's the parameters here's some guidelines to help you um in the last five years it's been incredibly late in the process that we get that word and it ends up impacting our communications with this commission um what i'm going to recommend is that independently csd begin the prep work there are certain things we know are going to be a part of it no matter what the parameters are um, and we could probably start that and be ready to go um what do you think long early november connect with the ad hoc and then november at the november meeting we bring in and discuss it with the full commission are where we're at N noting though that this is still very early in the process and you know there'll be iterative changes as it moves on but we we do know from past experience that november is the month when the commission needs to uh, have an opportunity to speak yeah. on this otherwise it's yeah. it's, mm -hmm. it's a tight window and it's too late yeah and so is there anything that we can do as a commission i can do as chair to communicate uh our des desire and uh, to, to encourage the appropriate priority to move forward with this? Um, you know, I'm glad to share that with OMB because we'll be connecting with them and I'll make it known. We've got a commission that wants to be involved and it's difficult. We don't have advanced warning. So I'd be glad and, to share And we're that. frustrated that we have not had an opportunity to be more directly involved in the past when it's part of our specified role. Mm -hmm. We'll do. Probably the best way to proceed with that would be to review the the past CIP and uh, as a starting point, and then along with any input that you already have, that your 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 best projections that you have uh, for the future CIP, and have, have that as something to review. That and then we can look for, to provide input on uh, what what else uh, we might what other recommendations we might make beyond that. So also coming up for uh, on the on an agenda this year is the Family Rec Center, targeting for November right now. We're hoping so. Yeah. I mean, and racket racket court policy action likely in November. So. We have a, 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 lot, a number of items we want to get in in the next three months, and I think we need to be focused on making sure we have a, we have three to, three agenda items each for each meeting. If we only have two at the next meeting, then we'll be in a difficult place to get things done by the end of the year. Which leads me to my final uh, the discussion item in terms of uh, our meeting dates for the upcoming holiday season. Yeah. Uh, we, Darren, what's the best process for sorting out when we'll be meeting in November or December? It would be helpful to get verbal input now to get uh, some. I think that would be very helpful. Okay. Uh, I will be out of town Thanksgiving week. Uh, there is a fifth Tuesday in November. So a potential meeting date could be if we were looking to reschedule uh, from the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, a potential meeting date would be 29th. Tuesday, November 29th. 
November 29th. You'll be out of town the 29th. And the 28th as well, or? Uh, yeah, we, <clears throat> I mean, I could call them. Is, is anyone else planning to be out Thanksgiving week? No. Thanksgiving week, yes. The, the Tuesday, of, the, the Tuesday the 22nd. 22nd. The Tuesday before Thanksgiving. So if, if everyone is available that day, then, then I can potentially uh, join remotely. Okay. So for now, we'll plan on sticking with that yeah. Tuesday, the 22nd. Yeah. So look, if, if anyone has input or if anybody has, has schedule updates, please let the uh, staff know. And then moving on to December. Normally, we do not meet in the last week of December, and usually we, when we move our meeting up a week or two. So December 13th is a Tuesday. December 20th is the Tuesday, obviously, as, as well. Do people have preferences? I'll be out the twentieth. I leave the seventeenth. So the week before, I'm at that December thirteenth. I think so. I'm good with that. I think December thirteenth would be a good day to to target. Does anybody have any conflicts with December thirteenth? Okay. <laughs> So if we get on the books, <laughs> if there are no objections, we could maybe send that out now. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Let's go ahead and do that. Great. All right. I, I didn't get us out of here before 10, but I think that was worth talking about. Anything else anyone would like to discuss before we adjourn? Um, well, thank you, everyone. We'll call this meeting to adjournment.